to the Realmcast. I'm your host, the Mortal Kombat fan, Tim. And with me, as always, is my co-host, our lore master, Yanni. Welcome, Yanni. Thanks, fan, Tim. And today we have our guest with us. He is the founder and CEO of Ibalistic Studio, Joe Tresca. Welcome, Joe. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Hey, thanks Thank for, for joining, joining us. Me. Yeah. So, Joe, before we kind of jump into why we brought you on board, let's kind of get some introductions out of the way. Tell us a little bit about uh, Mortal Kombat. Like, how has it affected you throughout the years? Yeah, so um, I started playing Mortal Kombat in the arcades. Uh, I think I was about 14 years old. And I remember um, distinctly going into there's a local pizzeria that I used to I used to go to like every Friday. Um, it's like close to food shopping, so my mom would drive me. Uh, she'd do the food shopping, and I'd just play like as much Mortal Kombat as I could. Um, and uh, when I remember when the game first came out, or prior to the game coming out, I had read a, an article in EGM magazine. And, uh, you know, I think Ed Boon and John Tobias were talking about this new technology and how they were uh, using digitized graphics. And I remember uh, that it was focused on Liu Kang, I think. Um, And they were showing sort of like how they have them on the blue screen or green screen background, whatever it was. And and they um, were showing how the process went, uh, you know, how they how they actually brought these characters to life. And I was thinking to myself, man, I, I would love to play this game, but I didn't expect it in my town. Like you read it in a magazine and this is like pre-internet days. So I didn't expect to see the game. And so I remember, you know, one Friday, um, I happened to take a trip with my mom usually to help her shopping. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I saw the game and I think, I don't know if everybody had the same experience that I had or, or the same feeling, but to me back then, the graphics were essentially, it was like you were playing a movie. Like it, to me, there was like this, I couldn't believe it. It was so far ahead of everything else. I mean, we had Pit Fighter, I think, before that. So there was sort of a glimpse of like what that technology could bring. But I was I was just blown away by it. And I, I was hooked from, from day one. Now, you know, you see the violence and the and all that stuff. But I think, you know, if you didn't grow up playing it in the arcades, that wasn't really what the draw was for me. There were so many other things to sort of like um, to focus on about what made this game great. First of all, like the realism. I used to watch like I think it was on USA Up All Night or whatever. It was like some they used to have these like really poorly dubbed martial arts movies that they brought here to the U.S. And you'd have to be up to like two or three in the morning like I usually was <laughs> um, against my parents' best wishes, of course. But yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would watch that stuff, and I was like, I was like, this is it. Like, I'm, I'm playing like one of those movies. Like, this is the coolest thing ever. And even like Mortal Kombat One, it has sort of this um, aesthetic to it that two and three and all the games beyond that don't necessarily capture. Where it almost has that filmic kind of like that old like martial arts film vibe to it. I don't know if it's the desaturation of some of the colors based on how they, you know, originally did it where they were um, digitizing the characters and the, and the background objects, but whatever it was, it, that aesthetic was just so pleasing to me. and so cool. Um, and so, you know, I didn't focus on the blood um, and nobody knew how to do fatalities. Like nobody, <laughs> right. So like you, I mean, if you, if you could do that, you were a legend. Right. And so, I think I played it for like um, like months and, and for hours at a time um, before anybody could do any kind of fatality. And I'm trying to remember if the computer opponents ever did fatalities to you. I can't re- recall specifically, but at one point or another, somebody, some kid was able to do like Sub-Zero's fatality, the spinal rip, right? And I just was like, I could picked up my, I couldn't, like my jaw, like I remember everybody was around that's the, I mean, we're talking like what, 12 people surrounding a cabinet because it's that big of a deal. And the excitement you could, you could, I mean, it was like, you could put a, you know, the air, you could cut, you could cut it with a knife, how excited people were. <laughs> and when that happened, it was like, oh, <laughs> like everybody kind of shouted out loud. It was almost like an involuntary excited reaction that, um, that we all had. And, um, and then it was like, you know, okay. So I'm like, I'm 14 and I'm like, 
this is the only thing I care about in life right now. Like this is, I need to know how to do that. I need to be able to have that people have that reaction. I need to go to other arcades once I know how to do it. Um, and so like, I, I just wanted to figure out all that stuff. And so I started dedicating myself to, to learning how to do all the, the fatalities. So they did end up becoming more of a big thing, but that wasn't really the initial draw. It's like Sub-Zero being able to freeze you and Scorpion being able to pull off his mask. And like, there's also this other thing that really attracts me to Mortal Kombat and has to this day. And that's this mystique behind it. Yes. Um, yeah. There's a, there's something to be said about even like, if you look at Mortal Kombat 2, like there's, you know, like on the living forest scene, there's that, that a guy who's kind of like wrapped up by the trees and he's dead. And like, you know, there's all those rumors like, oh, maybe you could like, he, he comes alive and he like feeds you to a tree or, and all of that stuff pre-internet being able to like, kind of lean into this, like, you know, what happens in the background here? Or like, oh, Kano and Sonya are stuck in the background, but you know, you could, you, your character can replace them or you could free them or all those little things just were, I just leaned into that. Like that was, that was it for me. And, and the mystique about it, like even with, with, um, you know, um, Scorpion, the first time he pulls off his mask, you know, he pulls off his mask and there's a skull underneath. I'm like, what, on, what is going on here? Like, what is the, what's the backstory behind this? Now, of course, when you actually play the games and you come back to it later on, you realize that back then the story was pretty minimal until like MK2 and then when it starts to, to get more of a, an actual story behind it. But the, the mystique behind it was so uh, compelling to me that I felt I was just, I was hooked. I was instantly hooked. Um, and so that's, funny that, to hear that. that's what it means. It's, like, from it's, funny it's, you it's so that. good to hear. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say like, you know, that sort of mysteriousness is gone these days with Mortal Kombat, it seems, because so much of it's discoverable just by, you know, going on Google and looking it up yeah. and, and like, oh, is there a way to do this? Or tell me about the secrets in this stage. And stuff like just that. data mines it now, like on the, yeah. the day of release yeah. phase or even before release. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like we didn't know we didn't know what you could do like there was rumors you could throw somebody into one of those trees and it would eat you and and like it's cool to see how the games progressed and incorporated some of that sort of thing but right back right. then we had no idea what what was out there what what we could do with the game yeah i mean it was really incredible because like you you basically became legendary if you could do any of these things and i remember when mortal Co one of the things too that struck me you know while we're on the subject is that mortal kombat 2 came out way faster than I expected it to. So I remember as a kid playing MK1 and just like, I must have played it for like eight or nine months, but I feel like MK2 released like really early. Like it was like eight months later, it seemed like when the game came, it was like so fast. And what blew me away about MK2 um, was that it had more of that mystique. It had more of that mystery. It had more of everything and it was better, really, I mean, I think, I mean, uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, subjective, but I think that it, it was better in every way than uh, MK1 was um, just by leaning into all of that stuff and really kind of making it, um, making, making you wonder, like, what's the, what's the ending for this character and, and, and really care about the story. It's probably the first fighting game that I cared about the story, for sure. Um, I didn't. You know, when you played Street Fighter, I was I played Street Fighter in '91. Um, you know, I guess it was a year before Mortal Kombat, and I didn't care. You know what Ken's story was or Ryu's story was. I, I just didn't care. Um, but but with Mortal Kombat, there was just it was a, there was a cool sort of mystique behind it. That um, yeah, like, to your point, it's totally it's not there in the new games, partially because of the ubiquity of the internet, but partially also I think. Um, I think because they know that they don't necessarily put the effort into trying to hide things because it's going to get solved. It's going to get figured out right. by the community in, in, in no time at all, which is a little bit of a shame. It's kind of like I yearn for the good old days when it comes to that. But uh, well, we the say new that. games are great in their own way. <clears throat> but we did have, um, what was it, the Meteor in MK11, which nobody figured out for what, a year that's or true. two years or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's true. So there is some of that still um, in, the, in, the, sort of like in their DNA. And uh, I'll, I'll get into it later when we talk about uh, my meeting with Ed Boone. But um, like Ooh, he, he, he's the one who brings that. He's the one that keeps he, he's definitely the one that the keeper of sort of like the 
anything that we loved about the past Mortal Kombat, he's the one that makes sure that that sort of uh, persists in the new game. So, um, yeah, cool. so it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, I, 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 I wish that they had more of that, but I also understand why they don't. <clears throat> so from those days then in the pizzeria with the arcade, who were you playing? Scorpion. Yeah, Scorpion, uh, Scorpion was uh, definitely my guy. And uh, as a fighting game player, um, I, I tend to be that way. I'm, a, I'm a, you know, there's some people when they play a game, they try like every single character to try to figure out which one's theirs. I usually do that like maybe one or two tries and then I find my character and I'm like, that's the character I'm going to master. That's the character I'm going to stick with. Um, and so Scorpion always just, uh, I loved the spear move. Um, somebody then like, I, all I used to do, you know, when I first started was the spear, cause it was the only thing I knew how to do. <laughs> and then, and then uh, I, somebody taught me the complicated at that time mo- motion you needed to require, you know, required you to do the teleport. Um, and I, I remember I could not figure out how to do that. So that was like an awesome moment when I was like, Oh, I can do this at will now. Like I can do. And then, you know, you start to realize the limitations of it. Like, Oh, if the person's against the side of the arena, then you can't do it. So you better be careful. You can't lean on that too much. Um, and then, you know, I, you start to learn more advanced techniques, I guess you could call them advanced, but like, um, you know, hop kicks, um, and, and hop punches, uh, where you, you're, you're not kind of like winding up to do the jump kick. You're kind of just, pushing fo- forward diagonally into the person um, and catching them, you know, doing like basically an anti-air. Um, that kind of stuff really was super exciting to me. And I always felt like the juggle system, because you could like kind of knock people back a little bit um, and juggle them a little bit was cool, but I wanted to see them do more with it. And then it was awesome when I saw what they did with Mortal Kombat 2, because they really kind of leaned into that juggle system where you could do like more than two or three hits, uh, combos, um, you know, to, to extend, make it, uh, you could kind of chain things together and do a little bit more, especially if you had somebody gets the, the side of the arena, um, the, the wall combos. Everyone, yeah. The wall combos were, were really cool. Um, I, I always think of Katana. She had a really good one where, you know, she could, huh. you know, do that, the, the, the air wave or whatever they called it. And then, and, um, and she had, yeah. And then, and then, you know, she could, you could use those together with the fan in the air. And then I think you could do it on the fan with the fan on the ground too. And it was like, it was, you, I, it was very impressive when you saw people um, pulling that off. In those um, days, it felt like it was a perpetual combo. You were in the air the entire time. <laughs> yeah. It was like, right. It's like, when am I going to land? You know? Um, but it wasn't frustrating. It wasn't frustrating. I know we're talking about Mortal Kombat, but I, I like to compare it to like Killer Instinct, um, I, which is another game that I love. Um, you know, that game was really, uh, intimidating because if you did know how to do like an ultra combo or you knew how to do something where the combos seemed to go on and on um, and you didn't understand how to do a combo breaker, um, you would just, you felt like you put two quarters in and you basically like someone reached into your pocket and just like stole that. Money. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you know, because it's like, I, I can't. And, you, and on top of it, you I mean, you're completely humiliated by, you know, your opponent who got like a 60 something hit combo on you. Um, so yeah, like it was never like MK2, I felt was the sort of, it really took the, the gameplay mechanics and, and sort of, uh, made them more mainstream. I think it improved upon everything. Um, and that was the game that I would say ultimately I spent the most time with, um, was, uh, playing Scorpion in MK2. And I actually had a, a time where I got so good I would, good, good, good within my local realm of people that I knew at the pizzeria, right? Um, but I actually had 144 wins in a row, which was, uh, it's Ooh. like my claim to fame. Uh, I was, uh, I was like unstoppable. And I remember, I, I'll just tell you this story because like I said, my mom would do the food shopping. And so that's like hours of gameplay on like two quarters, right? So my mom uh, came to basically get me to drive home and she was like, Joey, if you don't leave right now, I'm going to leave you here. And I, I remember saying, you know, she was right, of course. It's not, it wasn't fair for me to, to do that. But I was like, I didn't want to give up the controller. And like, I remember all the guys behind me were like, yeah, Joey, go, like, go to 
you know, go with your mom. <laughs> so when I when I left, they like everybody cheered because like they could finally play, and they, <laughs> and it was uh, it was a fun it was a fun moment that I won't I won't forget. It was embarrassing, but also fun at the same time. So I, I still I think I told Ed this too. I still wonder what would have happened if like my mom hadn't showed up because I literally had to stop there. Like it's not like I lost. I had to like give the controls to the kid who was standing behind me, who was like cheering me on the one person I had on my side, cheering me on, you know, so yeah. I was like, you can, you can take over. Yeah. So, so it's, it's good to hear you say that it, your favorites are Scorpion and MK2. Yeah, I think, I mean, I love Scorpion in general, but yeah, I'd say Scorpion MK2 would be my favorite if I had to choose between all the iterations. I, I found that in, you know, UMK3 and uh, Trilogy, uh, I just, I couldn't get into Scorpion for those games. Um, and so my other character that I played, cause I, 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 despite the fact that I was like, Scorpion was my main, um, was Baraka from, okay. uh, MK2. And I loved Baraka. He, so it was either Scorpion or Baraka. And then for a little while I played Shang Tsung, uh, because I really liked the fact that once you do has how to do his morphs, you could basically play any of those characters if you wanted and i love that he had like the the anti-air skulls that he could kind of produce um kind of knock people back or you could you could kind of play footsies right you could like move in and then jump back and kind of lure somebody toward you and then and then shoot out you know i think i'm trying to remember if it's three or four uh skulls um you know and it would be uh it would be a great way to kind of trap people. So yeah, I, I really uh, loved MK MK2 and, and those particular characters, but yeah, Scorpion is, was definitely my main. Uh, and it would only be if I was fighting somebody that found sort of a way to, to defeat mm. me with Scorpion. And then I was like, okay, I got to change this up, maybe change characters and, and sometimes, you know, hopefully get su- some success that way. <clears throat> it's cool to hear you talk about the game mechanics because of the reason that we brought you on this show. Um, you're actually working on the Mortal Kombat HD project, uh, Mortal Kombat in high definition. So yeah. can you give us a little bit of a rundown on the idea behind it? Oh boy. Um, should I, so where should I, should I start where like the inception and the background behind yeah. it or? Yeah, yeah let's go yeah. back to, yeah. to your MK. Right, we'll, yeah. we'll, go, we'll go, we'll go back. We'll go back. Yeah. This is an exciting story for me to tell. So, uh, all right. So, um, I'm going to go way back. I'm going to go back to 2011. And, uh, you know, my job before I got into game development was um, uh, I, I worked in advertising. Um, so I, I, I had an art, de- art degree in school. I'm a, I'm a um, classically trained artist, which doesn't, it doesn't mean much except to say that, um, like, in other words, I, I was trained to, to sculpt, to draw, to paint, like really traditional cl- classical art, basically. Um, and there's just a lot of art history behind that. And, and, you know, it, it, it all started from like, when I was like, whatever, when, as a kid, I used to draw like He-Man and like, I actually, as a kid could draw like all the muscles that He-Man had and people were like, oh man, like this kid's got talent. He's like, how's he doing all that? And it was me just drawing from my, I didn't, of course I knew nothing about like anatomy or anything like that, but I was able to draw from my head. Um, and so I really my life, I was like, okay, I'm going to be an artist. This is what I'm going to do. And so I got into, um, into art school and all that. And then I basically realized that you can't make money as an artist. Uh, you basically become a starving artist unless you like die and you've had then, then like once you're dead, then of course your paintings become worth money. Right. You're so, not starving anymore either. Yeah. You're not starving anymore <laughs> though, for that matter. Right. So, so I, 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 so I, I really, um, I leaned into uh, when digital, when I found out that I could basically do my art digitally, I really um, uh, leaned into that. And so I started to draw with the mouse, which I found out was a terrible idea, but I started to learn how to draw with the mouse. And then, um, you know, I got into 3D art, I got into graphic design, all the stuff that really is kind of appealing to the, um, to, to advertising. And I remember I got my first advertising gig and uh, it was with a big agency, Ogilvy and Mather, and I got to work on these huge clients like IBM, HP, and I mean, all across industries, cosmetics. I did stuff for Estee Lauder later on in my life. I worked for Aaron Lauder directly um, of, of uh, Estee Lauder's fame. You know, she's the, the, the owner. Um, and uh, I did, um, I ended up getting to do website design. And so I've kind of been like all over the place as a designer, as an artist. 
And, uh, but, but one thing that sort of carried with me throughout was that I was super into, um, even my college days, I was super into 3d art. Like I, I would, um, I, I, I didn't know that I wanted to get into video games back then. I think more, I was thinking more like, I don't know, I'm trying to think, is it like Toy Story, I guess, was around that time. So I was like, oh man, I'd love to like do st- this kind of thing for movies. So I was learning about like everything that comes with 3D art um, and, you know, texturing, lighting, um, sculpting, modeling, all that stuff. Um, all the traditional skills that I'd sort of built, I, uh, I, I was sort of bringing to that. And so... I eventually um, got into advertising. I went through many, many years doing, you know, working with a bunch of different clients. But then uh, back in, I'm not sure exactly the time, um, but it was right around 2011, um, maybe a year before that. I'm not sure. But uh, I did, um, I worked for uh, Estee Lauder, um, the cosmetics company, and uh, I was working for Aaron Lauder. And she, we made this thing called Let's Play Makeup. And um, basically what it was is you could, import your face and then apply Estee Lauder makeup products. And at that point, the only way Estee Lauder felt that you could actually make money was if you were to uh, actually have like, you know, one of the, if you were in the mall and then one of the counter people comes over to you and says, Hey, can I give you makeup, you know, with this particular, um, you know, brand of lipstick and, and concealer and all this stuff. And, and that was how they sold products. Um, so there was this transition period of like, how can we sell online? And so I uh, led up this team uh, to do the user experience and the design work for this product called Let's Play Makeup. And you could do this. You could basically apply these things, uh, you know, their their products to your face, and it would allow you to uh, see them and hopefully buy them. And it did super well. Like, it did better than anybody, I think, ever thought it would, certainly better than Aaron Lauder thought it would. And it increased sales by, like, 30%. So here I am. Um, I'm sort of like on Madison Avenue, right? Like Mad Men, right? And, uh, and, and I'm making, um, I'm making, uh, I have sort of this thing that has my name behind it. And so I'm getting phone calls. Now at that point, I'm a, I'm a, uh, associate creative director. The way it works in advertising, like if you climb up the ladder, it's like associate creative director, and then there's like creative director, and then there's group creative director. And then above that would be like an executive creative director that like guides all the group creative directors. So that's sort of the, the ladder to climb. So I'm an associate creative director. I'm on like the lower rung and I'm wanting to be a creative director. So I get a phone call and this company, which I won't name, basically says to me, Hey, we'd love to ca- have you come on. And you, because of what you did with the cosmetics, we want you to pitch $2 million worth of work um, with a, a giant cosmetics company. So I said, absolutely. I'm going to do this. And they said, they're going to give me a team of seven and you have 30 days to make the pitch and we're going to hire you. They threw a bunch of money at me. I remember my wife and I, we, we uh, celebrated in Vegas for a few days. It was like, it was a big deal. Like it was like, I made it like I'm creative director now. Woo. And so I get there and I do the whole thing. I I'm at the pitch. Um, it was for Avon. Actually, I can say, I can say the client was, it was Avon. So, um, when in advertising, when you put a pitch together, um, if you get invited to the client, it's a really good possibility that you're gonna you're gonna win the 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 work, which in this case would be like two million dollars worth of work, which is a lot of money in advertising um, for uh, for uh, Avon. We were gonna win them, um, you know, because you you do preliminary pitching where you send stuff out and they give you feedback. And so I was super excited. Thirty days in, I got my team. We're on there. And I give this whole presentation and a rousing applause. Everything's great. And then, you know, the, the uh, one of the executives over at Avon comes over to me and he says, Joe, congratulations uh, on a, an amazing pitch. Unfortunately, after hearing it, we've decided to go with another agency. So it was kind of like, oh, man, like, you know, this is that up and that down that you're like, all right. But this is kind of common in, in advertising. You're going to lose way more pitches than you're going to win. You kind of, it's a numbers game, right? The more pitches you do and, the, and you know, as long as you produce quality work, you're going to win. Um, so I, I, I don't know, somebody on my team must have called um, and let my, uh, you know, the executive creative director know what happened. And he said, Hey Joe, he's like, come back to the office. And I'm assuming like, okay, this is just going to be a, um, you know, we're going to do like a postmortem because you spend a, a decent amount of money, like fifty, sixty thousand dollars to do these kinds of presentations. And so you want to make sure you get it right next time if there's anything you prove. And so I, I get to the to the uh, agency and uh, he says, Joe, follow me um, and, uh, you know, head into the office and shut the door. And so, you know, 30 days into my dream job, I see the uh, 
the head of HR there, and it was pretty clear that I was going to be fired. So this was like the worst possible thing that could happen because um, my wife is pregnant with my son, Justin, at this point. Um, we had just bought a house. I'm like, all these things are swimming through my mind, like of like just how bad it's, I mean, it's never a good time to lose your job, but this was a particularly bad time. So I don't know how everybody else deals with sort of like the stresses of life. But for me, like some people I'm sure curl up with a book or some people, you know, watch movies. I always play video games and, and I had been looking forward to, because being a Mortal Kombat fan, the 2010, like there was the rumors in 2010 that they were going to be making, um, remaking Mortal Kombat. And there were some leaked screenshots and stuff like that. And it happened to be that I'm like on the train, the long train ride home, right? It feels like it's forever at that point. Um, you know, I, I remember it was the day that also that Mortal Kombat was announced that it was being canceled. And I was just like, I can't have any more bad news right now. Like this is the yeah. worst. I didn't want to tell my wife that I was basically let go. Um, and, and here I'm like, I can't even go into this, like my happy place, right? I can't even go, I can't, I can't look this off and, and just kind of like shrug it off. Um, and so I knew that I needed something to keep me busy because it, I wasn't going to find a job right away. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, and I needed to, uh, I needed to, you know, get my resume together, all that stuff. And I was like, I'm just going to take it easy here and, and like take a beat and kind of figure out what's next. And that, and so I went to, I didn't want to give up on like the Mortal Kombat stuff. And I, I don't know how I got there exactly, probably in desperation for something. Cause I was like, Mortal Kombat HD canceled. And I'm like searching through Google on my phone. And I eventually came across trmk.org. Um, and it, you know, it's a Mortal Kombat fan site. I think it's kind of dead now at this point, unfortunately, but, um, it, uh, it was a big deal back then. And I, I went on the site and I saw that a bunch of the Mortal Kombat fans were basically complaining. They were like, you know, the, the short story of that is that they, they'd seen, I think it was 2008, um, Street Fighter 2 HD remix had come out and that got the treatment from Udon, like where they redrew all the characters. And it was like, well, where's our HD remix? So somebody had this idea. I think his name is Smoke Tetsu. I'm going to give him the credit. Um, I love um, how, just, I have to interrupt quickly just to say, I love yeah, how sure. the moment Mortal Kombat fans come into it, the first thing we said is they were complaining. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it only makes sense, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, that's funny and, and true. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, and I'm part of that too. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly one of the complainers. Uh, guilty. <laughs> guilty as charged, right? Um, yeah, so I mean, I got I got to the point where I'm online and I'm seeing I'm seeing that the, they they want to make this game themselves. Like if if Warner Brothers isn't going to do it or NRS isn't going to do it, we're you know uh, we'll do it ourselves. I don't think they were actually another realm at that point. They were making a transition between like mm -hmm. Williams Games or whatever. And so I said I said to him, you know, uh, I hey guys, I have some experience. You know, if I can contribute on 3D art side, I can do some environments for you guys. Um, w would that be cool? And there was nobody like, it was kind of headless, right? There was no leader there. And so I kind of realized like, okay, if this is just going to die, if somebody doesn't kind of step in and organize. So I started organizing things. I was like, all right, who do we have on the schedule? And I'm like, I'm going to do the backgrounds. And then Gabe Melendez shows up. And one of the things we were like trying to figure out is like, some people were like, oh yeah, I, I have a friend who looks just like Johnny Cage and we could get him to, you know, and I'm like, and I knew from having shot commercials and doing some of the production work, like there was just no way we were going to like be able to get the proper lighting and like also completely remote at that point. I mean, which now we take for granted, but like, it just wasn't going to happen. Like there, there was no way back in 20, you know, 11, we were going to make that happen. So I, uh, Gabe shows up and he's like, what about if we do it in 3d? And he, he drops Scorpion, uh, UMK three Scorpion. And I think everybody collectively, like if the internet could, could gasp, they, they did because it was so good. People were like, dude, like what did you, how did you do that? Cause it was clearly in HD and it looked like a real person. Like it was back then, like to our brains, whatever it was, it looked real. Like you did not know that that was 3d unless mm -hmm. he told you, it just looked like he, he somehow found a way to like magically up res the original sprites. And <clears throat> I remember like that was the day that I, I, I messaged, uh, gave his, his screen name is bleed. And I was like, we've got to do this. Like, even if it's just you and I, we can do this. Like now I feel like we can do this. 
And Gabe was like, yeah, I'm all in. Let's do it. And so like a year later, we had like a Mugen or Mugen, I'm not sure how you say it, um, like demo that we put out there. And that was when Gabe got a, a, um, a not a cease and desist officially, but he got a phone call from the head. It was the head of Warner Brothers legal department. I mean, she was super nice. She was super nice. He told me that he, 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 in fact, he always implores me to, to tell everybody how nice she was because I have a tendency because of all the stuff that I've been through. I have a tendency to, to sort of, um, vilify, vilify the, uh, the, uh, Warner brothers for sure. I have a, I have a tendency to do that. Um, but that would be an, an unfair characterization because she was like, hi Gabe. She's like, I'm from Warner Brothers Legal. But don't be scared or anything. I just wanted to. Be, I, I love your work. Um, and she's like, but you know, you guys can't make a game because you know that's like that's kind of like IP infringement. Like you're totally cool with making fan art, but like, and and I love your work. You're super talented, but you just you cannot make a game. And so Gabe was like, okay, thanks, and like hugs up, and like pretty much. <laughs> That was it. He's like, dude, I am out. I'm done. I cannot do this. I can't be sued. Like, you know, it was just, it was the fact that she was so nice actually, I think made it almost more scary because to him, because he was like, that's like what they say before they're about to like pull the trigger and, you know, end you, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, all right, calm down, calm down. So Please like, he's like, game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So I'm like, I'm like, look, I'm like, can you like, he's like, no, I'm out. I'm out. So I'm like, wow, that's all right. Well then we have to stop. So we had a lull there from like 2013 to 2015 where I'm trying to regather talent. Um, and there was a guy, Ark Hawken, he, who showed up and he started out, like you watch this progression. He started out where like Liu Kang didn't look so good, but that was one of his favorite characters and he was learning 3d art. And so by the end of it, by the end of the two years, like, Liu Kang looked awesome. Like he, he nailed it. Like he had learned from just working on it every day. And it was really cool to see that progression. Um, and we attracted, um, uh, Justin Slaughter, who, um, his name is Django. Um, amazing. He, this is a guy who does film scores for, um, for, um, uh, indie films. And he was like, I'm a huge Mortal Kombat fan. He's like, can I join the project? And so he, he shows me, he like he redid one of the stage music and there's a part it's like Goro I think it was Goro's Lair and there's a part in it where you just hear like this heavy like duh, 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 like with a guitar like he's really like ripping it up on the guitar and he's doing this whole solo and I'm like dude where'd you get the guitar and he's like that's me man like I play the guitar he, he like plays you find out he plays like he's like a virtuoso he plays like every instrument he's got his own recording studio I'm like, this is, how did we get, like, how did we find you? You know, and, he's, and he loves Mortal Kombat. And he's like, he's like, yeah. And like, he went, he redid a bunch of the tracks. I'm going to try and see after the show. I want to share um, some links to his stuff. If you guys don't have it, but amazing work. And, and so we were just like, you know, at that point it was a lull. I'm trying to get people on board. And I decided I'm taking the project underground. So I was like, the, when they, basically did that cease and desist or whatever you want to call it, that verbal threat. It really, um, it made me angry at that point. I was like employed. Fortunately, it wasn't like I was out of work all this time. Um, uh, but you know, so it was more like a side gig for me, but I was kind of pissed off. I put a lot of effort into it and I was like this, the fact that they like did this means that we've got their attention. So I was seeing it in a different way than maybe other people were, they were seeing it more from a fear based kind of view where I was more like, no, this means we've got their attention. We can't stop now. That's not like how anything gets done. So I was like, we're taking it underground. It's got too much press and we continued making the game. And so by 2015, I had made the decision that I wanted to reach out to Warner brothers, like despite that and be like, Hey, we have an HD version of this game, which we did. We had it working in Mugen. Um, with Sor uh, Scorpion and Sub-Zero. And I was super excited about it. And I, I remembered, I reached out to Gabe um, years later and I was like, Gabe, we're going to make an official pitch now. Um, and it's going to be done under the Ibalistic team. So you're going to be protected. It's, it's going to be like, if anything, my company is going to get sued. It's not going to be you. And that's how we're going we're gonna to do this. I think that, and I said to him, I think that they don't take us serious because we're just a bunch of fans. But if we put together a company, they're going to see us in a different, in a different light. They're going to take us seriously. And at he this said, point, 
um, had, had you have you had you spoken to like uh, lawyers and, and things like that before going into this pitch? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. so, so ridiculous and like even now it's like so embarrassing that you're asking that and i'm like like <laughs> why didn't i like what was wrong with me no like i was literally I, my view was kind of like i had i had no fucks left to give it, 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 yeah. for i was just like i'm like I'm, i like i wanted i just wanted to see something happen with this at this point um i should mention that i have a cousin who works in the in the film industry um and he's sort of like i don't know i want to necessarily say a mentor but he certainly had a little bit more insight into like how this works and he was like dude this reminds me of like that film that they told him that you couldn't make and like the director just was like fuck you and he went and he did it and it made made that like the company ended up he made like millions of dollars off it and he was like don't you know he's like be that guy be the guy that you know he was like pushing me to be like a rebel (laughs) and uh i'm like don't get me in handcuffs here dude you know but anyway so i ended up i was sort of inspired from from my talks with my my cousin Danny and uh and he was and he was like yeah you should totally do it and that's what got me to think like because he was like dude if you're gonna if you're gonna do this get paid for it like don't just be a dumb sort of like you know like like kind of a fool right if you're gonna do this work don't don't let yourself get taken advantage of and and he was right and I was like you know I, I was doing this in the beginning just for free but now I'm doing it just out of passion for, for like, I want to get paid <laughs> at this point. I want to see the guys that have done worked so hard on this get paid. Like that was the thing I wanted to get everyone paid. And it was, it was like, it was cause I was leading this and I felt like there was some level of responsibility. Like I was telling people that I was asking a lot of people to put a lot of time and effort into this. And, uh, you know, to that point, by the time we get, so I, I remember, so, all right, I don't want to jump around too much, but I basically ended up giving the, 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 um, I sent it. I, I don't know if you guys remember E3, you know, that was a big deal. It's not, it's, it's not around anymore, but E3 where the, they show the games every year, uh, the new games that are coming out. There was this thing, if you were a part of E3, um, called connected E3. And so I'm going to, I'm going to just, I'm going to, give a little confession. So you can't get into E3 unless you're a, an industry professional. Um, I totally faked my E3 credentials to the point where like, like, like I had to make, I had to falsify so many documents to get in to E3. All right. So I'm just, gonna leave to, it at just that. to be sure. Are you okay saying this on here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay now. <laughs> it's, E3, it's E3 and I don't even think E3 is a thing anymore, but, but yeah, I had to, I had to, to fake a lot of stuff to pretend that I was a developer. Um, and I showed some of the stuff that we were doing with Mortal Kombat. And I was like, oh, we're already engaged in a deal with Warner Bros. Like, I really was full of shit. And when I came to, when I got to that, I couldn't believe when I got my pass to go because it's free. Man. If you don't have a pass, you need to have somebody pay for you. And it's like $900. It was, re- it was pretty expensive. So I was like, I, um, I need to get to this show. So I ended up going in 2015 and I started a, I brought the game with me and I'm like, I'm like harassing the girl, the poor girl at like Warner Brothers booth. And I'm like, Hey, I'm like, I got a, I have a version of Mortal Kombat in HD. It was kind of like on the D, you know, DNL, right? Like, I'm like, I'm like, I've got this game. I'm like whispering it to her. And she's like, okay. Like, what do you want me to do about that? I'm like, who can I show this to? And she's like, well, we don't really have anybody here for that. And so uh, basically she was like, but I'll meet with you in like an hour and a half and you can show it to me. So we come up with a meeting time and a place and she completely blows me off. Doesn't show up. Doesn't. Th- I had no way to contact her and she oh. disappeared from the rest of the show. So I ended up coming home with sort of my tail between. I mean, it was a cool experience to, to kind of like get in there and see all that. But at the same time, I was like, my objective, my goal was missed. So now it's it's getting to be 2016. We're still kind of working on it. I'm trying to keep everybody's faith in the project that it's worth doing. Um, at one point, uh, I remember Gabe saying to Gabe, like, oh, we need to add this and that. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. And he ended up, Gabe is crazy when it comes to like his work ethic. Like uh, he would work on something for like three days straight. And I'd be like, Gabe, have you slept yet? And he's like, no, I haven't slept. I'm like, have you eaten? He's like, no. I'm like, dude, what are you, you're killing yourself. Like, 
three days now. Like, you know, oh. maybe it's like two and a half, but like, he's like, I'm just, I want to get this done. I like, I believe in it. And I was like, this is the guy that he needs to be along my side for everything that we do going forward. So, um, you know, and that, that's been the case ever since, but so we, we, so I, um, it was around summer of 2016. So it was like another year had passed. Um, and I, once again, I, I was like, we have like now a much more polished version of what we had before, before it was playable, but it didn't have, a lot, it was missing a lot of sound effects. And now I have like a video of it captured. And, and I say video because I went from, oh, it'll be playable to, uh, it's just going to be a video because you again back then couldn't handle HD sprites. So you had about a minute and 30 seconds before the game would crash. So I had to film, I had to, I had to screen cap just the amount of gameplay we could get before the game would crash. And so I stopped promising playable and started promising, uh, uh, you'll see a video of it in action. Um, and so I sent that video out to, this was E3 all over again. Um, and now there's this, yeah, that's the thing that I was trying to say. I think I, 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 I spoke too soon. Connected E3 was this way that if you're like, and once you're at part of E3, then they just kind of accept you for the next year. They're like, oh yeah, you're an industry insider. You don't have to prove it. You're in. So I, I knew I was going to go to E3 again. And so I, I get access to this special thing that lets businesses talk to each other. It's called, it was called Connected E3 or something like that. And I reached out to Warner Brothers and this guy responds to me. His name is Mick Pack. Love Mick. Shout out to Mick. Awesome guy. Still works there. And I, as far as I know, he, um, he uh, heads up the, um, the uh, mobile versions of, of, you know, the Mortal Kombat games. Great guy. And so I ha- I sent him this email and he's like, Joe, I'm actually not going to be there. And like this year, we don't actually have any reps that are going to be there. But I, sh- I sent this to uh, my boss, Sean, and he's really interested. And I'm like, oh, Sean who? And he's like, Sean Hemrick. And I'm like, whoa, that's another room studios like head. And I'm like, yeah. okay, all right, that's good. So, um, it, it, you know, I'll spare you all the time that went in between that, but it was like I had to contact legal department. It's like, hey, so we want to see that your exec, uh, apparently one of our executives wants to talk to you about something. So I'm like, yeah, uh, it's going to be, and they're like, what's the topic going to be about? And like, they made me sign this agreement. It's a, it's a, it's an NDA, but it's like a really draconian NDA that basically says if anything we do, in the future happens to be like what you pitch to us, you can't sue us. Um, And so it's like, it totally covers like any idea theft of any kind whatsoever. And that becomes important later on because anyway, so we get to this point now where um, I'm, I'm uh, I finally get all the legal stuff out of the way. And Sean has been talking to me back and forth through, through email. And he's like, you know, I'm sending him screenshots and I'm like, just, this is like, I am like blown away by this. Like this is, this is like, I felt like th- I can't believe this is even happening right now. And, and I remember, um, so I, as I told you guys earlier, I was, I'm a, you know, I had just become a creative director and that means you start to get into doing pitches. But um, to be fair, I didn't do a lot of pitches like that Avon pitch where I basically got fired 30 days in. Um, I was one of my first pitches that I actually led. Um, and so my, public speaking skills, all the things that you kind of need, like your salesmanship and getting people to laugh at the right times when it comes, like, it's all like a a formula that you have to follow um, or you have to be good at in order to to be good at your job. And I was still basically a beginner. And, you know, Ed's like, I mean, eventually Sean says, yeah, and I need you, we're going to have a meeting with Ed. And I'm like, Ed Boone, I'm like, just, and he's like, yeah, Ed Boone, like, who else would it be? And I'm like, I'm like, so fanboying out at this point because that to me that's like my george lucas that's my i mean in every way he's my idol right um being what getting to do what he did like getting to make a game like mortal Kombat, i was like i always thought even when i was young like what that would be the coolest job ever like it had to be the best job ever and i just i didn't know it back then but having sold my soul to advertising and everything it was leading me to my true path of what I needed to do. That's, that's what Mortal Kombat really means to me, like leading me to my true path. But so I get to this, to this point now where I'm doing this presentation for Ed and, uh, and Sean's going to be there and they're, they're having this whole setup. And basically um, I am a nervous wreck. I remember like 
practicing in the mirror, like every day, like what I'm going to say, like, like a crazy person, just like, what am I, how am I going to, you know, say this? Cause it's going to be a video chat. Um, it was a video chat back then. They weren't going to like fly me in or anything like that. <clears throat> and, um, so I, I, the day comes, I'm super nervous. Um, but I give the presentation and, uh, Ed was like, he listens to the whole thing and Ed's a programmer. I, I think you guys know. So he, um, I, I actually became a programmer later on in my career. Um, uh, so I can relate to that analytical way of thinking. Um, but he, he, uh, he had a very specific, he had, his questions were very pointed. Like, how are you going to match the frames of animation? And I fortunately had answers for a lot of his technical questions, um, which was a little scary for me because it's like Ed Boone. And there was a lot of stuff that he was like, I don't really understand how you're handling that. Like he would challenge me. It wasn't like he was just like treating me like, um, like a fan, you know, he was super um, unassuming, very, very like, um, you know, you get no sense of ego from this guy who's had like a ridiculous amount of uh, success, but he, he was just really to the point about his questions. Um, and, you know, he, one of the things he asked was how, you know, the, the original game runs at like 54 frames per second. How are you going to handle like getting this game running on a, on a 60 Hertz, um, flat screen TV, um, you know, at 1080p, um, and have that m make up for those frames. And I said, well, Ed, as you know, you repeat a certain number of frames in the original game. And so this is an opportunity for us to make sure that instead of repeating frames that we are now, um, we are in inserting some new frames. And I said, the, there's go there's going to be a difference of frames that about six frames, no matter what. Um, the question is, uh, how much of a difference do you feel like that's going to have on the gameplay? And I said, I don't feel like it's going to have an appreciable difference. And I referenced, um, Mortal Kombat trilogy, which was the first time, really, I think a Mortal Kombat game that was like from the arcade, well, probably MK3 on PlayStation um, would have been the first one, but they, when they had to convert it to 60 frames per second from that 54 frame, 0.2 frames per second that the arcade is. And I said, so if we could do it then, we can certainly figure this out. Um, and so Ed started, because again, he's an engineer, he's a programmer, he starts thinking about ways we could do that, which was really positive to me because it meant that he wasn't saying no, he was like, this is cool enough that I want to think about a solution. And he was like, and I was like, you know, one of the things that we did when we were making the, the first um, version of the game is we took screen grabs, not screen grabs, a uh, video from MAME emulated. And we overlaid our HD sprites exactly on top of the original arcade sprites. So we had videos of like every character jumping, every character performing every move, and we would overlay our HD sprites on top of that so we could match gameplay just about as perfect as you possibly can, right? How many pixels high does somebody jump relative to a 1080p screen versus whatever it was, 640 by 480? And so like all of this technical stuff, we were really kind of trying to work out and figure out. And I think Ed appreciated that. And so um, outside of that, we got into what does Mortal Kombat mean to you? And I told him that he's essentially like meeting George Lucas or, you know, Steven Spielberg, you know, like it's that big of a deal for me. And he was like, oh, you're too kind. And, you know, just a really, really nice man. Um, you couldn't ask for anyone better to sort of have the success that he's had. Um, I could go on and on about Ed. I, I just love the guy. He's such, such a good guy. But one of the things that he said was, Joe, he, after all that, and it's like, you're sort of like your heart's on, you know, your heart's on your sleeve. You're kind of like not sure what's going to happen. And, um, and they did, they did kind of a good cop, bad cop, because you have Sean Hemmerich there going, Joe, how do we know this game is going to make money? How do I know if I give you money, you're not going to go run away with it? You guys have no games made, blah, blah, blah. And he's sort of rapid firing these things off at me. And then Ed would be like, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so they did a, a little bit of a good cop, bad cop uh, scenario with me on that. Um, but I, was, I think I was able to answer a lot of his questions. And he said, okay, I like it. And he said, first of all, he's like, I didn't know that your characters were 3D until you told me. So that immediately is super impressive. And he's like, and then um, 
I think that you've really thought through the intricacies of how we would actually translate this. He's like, it was a bit of a test to see if you thought it through. Um, and he's like, and you passed, you know, and he's like, and I, he's like, I, I want to go forward with this, but he's like, I don't know what the next steps are. So he's like, Sean, how do we handle this next? And he's like, well, I think we put him in touch with, um, you know, uh, somebody over on WB side and we start telling them that we support this project. And he said, now, one of the things that always stuck with me is he said, if we do this, I want to make sure Joe doesn't lose his shirt. And I'm like, what the heck does he mean by that? That's kind of a, that's a bewildering and ominous question thing to say out loud. And that becomes clear later on because basically he knew they were going to, WB was going to chew me up and spit me out. He knew that was what was going to happen. Um, and he wanted to make it clear that he was supporting us and he needed, he knew that one of the difficult parts of this was despite him supporting it, he would, he would need to get some support from within Warner Brothers to make it happen. Um, it's, it's so good to see, firstly, not only that he was actually interested in the project itself and asking you, you know, questions which demonstrated that interest. But on top yeah. of that, firstly, trying to help you solve some certain things and then trying to sort of protect you too. That is really cool to see it like with that sort of environment, you know? He, the fact that he, he, it always stood with me and that's why I, I have nothing but great things to say about him is that he, that was the first thing on his mind was that he wanted to protect, to protect us. And he said that one of the things that, you know, he, he, another thing he said was, if we do this, it has to be you because you're a real fan. It has to be Joe and his team. He was telling his, the rest of the guys on the call. It has to be Joe and his team because he gets it. He gets it. You, he, there's that passion. I can hear that passion. And he's like, and, and you can tell that they're going to do the best possible job, the job that we can't do because we're focused on the newer games. He's going to do that. And he said, so, so I, he's like, honestly, it would be hard to trust anybody else to do that, but you, this is the right kind of person you would want to have make this kind of game. And that, those kinds of things that like, you st- I'll go to the grave with, with that. It's like, yeah. yeah, it sticks with you forever. You know, like that, that was super inspiring and really, yeah. I mean, it was, it was the right time to hear that because he could have easily been like you guys, you know, it could have gone South. Right. But it, it didn't. And so he was like, okay, so next step is I need you to talk to um, WB finance. And so we get into that. I, I, I will spare you the, there is a, there's a guy over at WB finance and we have literally had screaming matches with each other. It like got oh, wow. to that level. Um, because I was going to ask why, is, because you had two sort of th- like, I've seen reasons, different reasons for why the project didn't go ahead at the time. And I wanted to ask which one those are. And it sounds like we're sort of getting that. Here. We're getting so to that for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So this, this guy, um, I, I mean, I, I could just probably just, I'll say his first name, but I'm not going to say anything else, but his first name is Chris. Chris, um, he's a good guy. All right. I want to get that out of the way. He's not a bad guy. He's just doing his job. And his job is to make sure that from a financial perspective, any money that they put into an asset, right, which is how they look at us, they would look at iBallistic, my team, as an asset, right, building one of the most successful franchise, billion-dollar franchise, right? So we're, we're building something for them. He needs to make sure that I have my head in the right place, um, that I understand everything from a financial perspective that I won't wilt at the first sign of um, pushback, right? Like if WB says, no, you got to start over the game's garbage. Like, am I going to be like, well, then we all quit. And like, then they're on, they just lost their money. Like there's a lot of that stuff. And so he didn't explain any of that stuff to me. I had to kind of figure that out about Chris. I think we have a mutual respect for each other after this, but um, he basically was like, I remember when I met with him, it was like, hey, Chris, nice to meet you. I'm all excited to talk. And he's like, he's like, listen, he's like, from my perspective, I want you to know right now, you're just a fan and you don't really matter to me. Like, that was how he opened it up. And he's <laughs> like, the only reason I'm talking to you is because Ed said I should. And I think I took him aback because I have, I've been around the block and I, I mean, advertising is brutal. So you, When I've done, well, I haven't done a lot of pitches. I've done a lot of contract negotiations with people on the phone and you have to get me back. Right. And so I remember saying to him, I was like, well, Chris, this isn't the start that I wanted. I'm like, but I'll say this. If you don't want to talk to me, 
then why are you wasting my goddamn time? I'll hang off the phone right now. And I basically, he stuttered. He was like, what, 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 what? Like, it, was, it was hilarious because he didn't expect, he didn't, ex- he expected me to be like some like, gee whiz kid who's not going to, who's just like, whatever you say, sir. And I basically was like, that's not the way this, this conversation is going to go. And I said, look, the fact that Ed is asking you to do it means that obviously we're a little bit more than just a bunch of fans, right? So maybe you should think about that. And I'm like, I'm going to hang up, Chris. I'm going to hang up. And he was like, no, 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 no. Let's talk. Let's talk. And, and so we t- <laughs> he's like, you're right. We did get off on the wrong foot, Joe. And it was a total change of demeanor. But he's like a wolf, man. Like, like you got to wait. You like he'll be cool with you then. Right. And then only up to the certain point when he wants to get a point across or he's trying to get some aspect of the contract that we were trying to form together. That's when he, he comes out like, you know, throwing daggers at you. Um, and so uh, we had I mean, I won't, paychecks. Yeah, exactly. Because he signs a pay at the end of the day. So I, I, I said to him, he said, get together like 10 different companies that can help you with this because you guys can't do this. You can do the art, but there's no way you can do the programming. And he's right. I had no programmers to speak of. We were basically a bunch of artists um, and, and, a, and a musician, right? A, and a sound guy, Justin. Um, so we were like, um, I was like, okay. So I reached out to a whole bunch of different companies. I won't say what they are. They're big, some big, big ones though. Um, and I got to form relationships with all of them and I got them to give us, you know, in, in the game world, you do, um, you, you do like a, uh, a request for proposal and RFP. It's pr- pretty much the same thing in advertising as well, but you kind of say, here's the basics of the game. You don't even necessarily say that it's Mortal Kombat, but people guess when it's from Warner Brothers. And you basically say, you know, it's a fighting game. It's uh, and we're trying to. It needs to have network play. It needs to have this, this, and this. And you go over the the basics of it, and then companies pitch it. And so I got to form a lot of relationships. It was great that I had the opportunity to to do that um, because I got to meet all these great um, people, um, and I got to learn what it's like to be on that side of the the uh, of the the scene where you're trying to. You know, you're a game studio and you're pitching to try and win the work. And so I learned about milestone schedules and all the things that they don't like. You're not going to learn that unless you're doing it. Um, and so it was it was just a massively beneficial to my growth as to where I am with my company today. Um, and I did back then. I just didn't even know it was happening. I was just like, I want to get this game made. And so we got to the point where he basically I got together all the different um, teams and they basically were like, this is going to co- cost north of $3 million to put together. Um, and we're, and we don't believe more than 100,000 people are going to buy it worldwide. And they said at tops, 200,000. And they said, we're basing it off of data that they had that said that um, the original, I guess, Mortal Kombat collection, I guess it's called arcade collection, right? They, they, they lost money on that. Um, and they were not eager to get back into, into that. They, it was just something they were scared to do. Really. They were afraid to, 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 to put any money into this. And so that, said, was, Look, I, that was yeah. so different than what you guys are doing. I mean, that, that was a re-release so of 2d games on modern platforms and like people already have that game. People have had like, that's all reason we have Mortal Kombat fans because everybody has those original games. So a lot of people weren't eager to go out and buy the same thing again. So I, I totally agree. And I, and I said that what you're saying is what I said to Chris to then later Sean, cause Sean had, uh, Sean had me connected to, you know, Sean's not the bad guy in this situation, but he, he, he connected me to, um, their, uh, one of their analysts, their, uh, marketing analysts. And he basically said that guy was like, look, you can say what you want as a fan, but he's like, I have the data. Like this game is not going to sell you know, we're going to put, we're we're just not going to chase, you know, if we make any money on it whatsoever and and not lose money, we're chasing like what a few million dollars in sales. It's it's just not, it doesn't move the needle for us to be worthwhile. Um, And so I remember ending that conversation uh, at the end of like summer, basically being like, um, Hey guys, you know, uh, sorry, it didn't work out to, to Sean and and Ed. And basically uh, Sean said, look, Ed supports you. Chris said the same thing too. Uh, after all that, after all we've been through, he was like, I, here's what I'd say. He's like, well, this isn't going to happen now. 
He's like, there's no reason why I can't see this happening in support of like our next game, like as a, a like a, a, a pre-order bonus or something like that. He's like, so maybe that's something you want to keep in the back of your mind. And, and then um, uh, I ended up talking to Sean and he was like, Sean, this is, Sean said to me, he's like, Joe, this isn't the end of the road for, for this. He's like, it's just, it's not no forever. It's no right now. And so I was like, okay, so what should I do, Sean? And he was like, why don't you see if you can get together a team to make this, how can you make it cheaper? How can you make it a little bit less of a risk? Maybe you can gather an investor on your side. And of course, back then I didn't, I wish that that question were asked to me today because now I could like ring up, I have so many investors I could call and they'd be like, Mortal Kombat? Yeah, <laughs> and that would be done. That would be, it would be a joke. But back then, uh, that's what they were saying that they needed. They needed some kind of um, maybe an external uh, backer that would be like pay, basically license it. And so this way, all the risk would be off of Warner Brothers, um, you know, and we would be able to do it. So that year goes by and I finally, I meet, um, I ended up interviewing a bunch of people uh, as a programmer to join iBallistic. And I met um, Joe Strout, who is probably the smartest person I've ever met in my entire life. He's just brilliant uh, as a programmer. And also, I mean, like, this is a guy who six weeks before he was going to Japan, he studied Japanese writing and, um, and language and could speak it fluently and could write and read it. And like, that's the level wow. of, he's just brilliant. And, um, and he, so he's my lead engineer, needless to say. Um, and, and, and he, um, we also got another, my, uh, engineer, Michael Summers, who started out more junior, but as like, at this point, he is like so senior at this point, he does everything with console development. And like, he knows the ins and outs of like getting stuff to run on PlayStation five and Xbox series X and all that good stuff. But in terms of, um, early on, I was like, guys, I can't pay you any money, but this is what I have going on. Potentially we could win Mortal Kombat. And obviously that would be a big payday for you guys. Are you interested? And they were like, yep, sign us up. And so we started, we made a brand new version of the game um, in two different formats. There was a uh, game maker, which was being done by Justin Slaughter, who had a lot of experience with uh, game maker. And he was like, I could totally do this game in game maker. And I was like, you do that. Meanwhile, we're going to build another version of it in Unity. And I, I think you guys have probably have seen that floating around. It was leaked by one of my guys um, to, to, the, to the world. Um, but I don't know if you haven't seen it. There's videos of it. Uh, HD Mortal Kombat. You can see on YouTube. You'll see it. Um, and there's two versions of it floating around. And um, the, uh, I, I took, it was the Unity version because that was the one that was most like the the arcade um and i got a meeting with ed all again and i remember it's the start of that was like i was like well ed here we are again and he was laughing and he thought that was funny i'm like I, i'm not gonna waste your time saying that it's like talking to steven spielberg or whatever I'm like you know all that you're the best i'm like and i'm like i'm like but this time around like i'd really like to see this game get made and ed was like yeah we would we would too so show me something so show me what you can do to make that happen. And so I came back to him with like a ridiculously cheap number. It was like $700,000 all in and we would program the game. It was like, you just, it's unheard of how cheap that would have been. When was this? Online play. And this is um, 2017 leading into 2018. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is way cheaper than the three, the north of three million that they said it was going to be. Of course, there's always money that they add onto it because you've got to have marketing and all that stuff. That, that lots of money goes into that. Um, but I'm saying to them, you know, we can do this a lot cheaper. And so Ed is like, I'm in. Let's do it. I need you to test. I need NetherRealm's QA team to test this game um, as uh, as and just make sure that it plays right. So not only did he play it live and gave it the, its blessing, he was like, this plays great. He's like, this and is played your game. game. He played it. He played it. Wow. Yeah, him and Shook, him <laughs> against Sean Hemmerich and, uh, and uh, I'm going to say um, Andy or Andrew. I'm not sure how to say uh, – I'm, I'm probably misremembering his name. Uh, he was like a senior producer. They all played, and they were—they were, they told me they were eating pizza 
Because I was like, I hope the guy <laughs> eats right around lunchtime. He's like, oh, we got pizza. It's all good. I'm like, oh, man. Deep di- I bet it's like deep dish, like Chicago. <laughs> Chicago style, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, he's like, yeah. He's like, we only get the best here. But yeah, they were so they were playing it and um, and they, they loved it. And so it was like, they were like, but we want to test it to make sure. He's like, I want to make clear. It says, we don't care about bugs. He's like, we get that as a development team. Like, there's going to be bugs. Like, that's fine. What we mostly mostly care about is the feel of the game. Like, did you did you nail the feel of the game? Um, and that's and so um, they actually got one of their lead testers, and I'm totally gonna forget his name. Although I'm connected with him on Twitter. Um, God, uh, yeah, they got one of their lead testers. Uh, I can't remember his name, but uh, um, he so he basically gave the thumbs up and said, "Okay, um, this is good." And so I remember getting that email and that was like about three weeks to a month later. So it was like, really, it wasn't quick, you know, they, like they beat on the game. They had a bunch of people play it to try and break it. And they were like, no, this is awesome. Um, and so they pushed us on to WB. And so now I'm, I'm, it's a different part of WB. So now I have a producer that represents me for the first time on the WB side. He was great. And um, he was like giving me like, uh, I guess you would say like notes of what I should say and how I should handle this. And so I have this big executive meeting and I'm not going to go into the people that were in the room there. I want to keep their, their names sort of somewhat anonymous, but, um, there was, uh, we, uh, I remember getting into the room. Um, it was virtual. It was all done, uh, you know, through Skype or whatever it was. And, uh, I'm doing my pitch and about 15 minutes in somebody arrives late. Okay. And he's like, he, then he listens for about five minutes and five minutes in, he kind of stops me short. He's like, Joe, all right. I, I don't, he's like, I don't care. <laughs> like that. I don't, he's like, I don't, I don't care. He's like, who are you? Just like that. And I'm like, well, I mean, we're just a bunch of, he's like, no, who are you? He's like, I have on my message machine, three messages from Ed Boone that say, I need to talk to you. I've been pushing it off. I don't just talk to anybody. Who are you? You don't have any games. You guys have nothing behind you. Tell me how this isn't a giant waste of my time. So that's how, and that's how my first meeting with Warner Brothers. And I was like, uh, you know, re- truly Warner Brothers, like the executive level, Warner Brothers, uh, you know, interactive entertainment. And I was like, I, I have to say, I'm usually pretty quick on my feet, but I kind of was speechless. I didn't necessarily know what to say. I was like, I don't really know what to say to make you feel like we can do this, but I would implore you to play the game and just keep in mind that if Ed is saying that, who programmed the original game, then obviously we're not just like some run of the mill, you know, group of fans that have a a pie in the sky dream to do this. We can actually pull it off. And he said, that's fair. And he's like, all right, well, I gotta go. And that was that. So he left and then I'm like, I'm like, okay. Don't know what that means. And then basically that ended the entire meeting. So what was supposed to be 45 minutes for a pitch, they were like, okay, well, I guess we're done here. And I was like, so when am I going to hear back? Or am I not going to hear back? Or was that the end? And they were like, um, yeah, we'll let you know. We'll call you. Don't call us kind of situation. So I had all their emails and I had to find like the guy who came into the room. I had to find his email. Um, I, there was another guy who popped in. I had to find his email. I managed to gather all them because you figure out like it's like first name, that last name at WB, you know, whatever. I'm not going to go into what it is, but you figure it out. Right. So I was like, I was like, OK, so I'm going to email these guys. And I started doing like a newsletter format where I was like, hey, again, like here's Joe Tresco from my ballistic. Here's all the reasons why this would be an awesome game. And literally every three days I sent them an email to implore them to give us an answer and support us. And I would get to their credit every few days, they'd reply and they'd be like, we haven't come to a decision yet, Joe, but we see you're so passionate about it. And that always helps. Um, and eventually the guy who was kind of mean in a sense was like, Joe, I played your game. And he's like, honestly, I can't, believe, I don't know how you pulled this off. This is more polished than most of the games. He's like, we receive a thousand pitches every year at least. Um, he's like, I'm going to recommend that you get put in the top five. Um, and he's like, we'll take it from there. That's not a promise. That's not a go ahead. That's nothing more than just to say that you've, you've passed 
the test that I wanted you to pass. Um, it, the game plays good. It looks great. Um, yeah. He's like, I, I, I'm into it. Um, so at that point, uh, I, I'm super excited and then months go by and now we get into 2018. It's like January, 2018. And I get a phone call from one of the executives, different one this time, the original one who reached out to me to talk. And she's like, Joe, I, uh, it's been a long time. Um, and you know, I, we haven't talked and I want you to know that, uh, we're giving your game the green light. And I, I think it like, I will admit to tears of actual happiness streaming for like, there's only been a few times, like when my son was born, when I was married, like where involuntarily I was so happy that I cried happy tears or whatever those are that, but I was that happy and I had put so much time and effort into it. I remember hanging up the phone and like with my hands in the air, like sliding down the wall and just kind of being <laughs> like, this is it. Like we did it. And, um, uh, I was, so excited. And so the next day she was, she sent me, um, there was this other company. I'm not going to name that. They were like, we want you to talk with this other company because we're probably not going to bring you a programmer on. We need somebody that has like, we want your art team, but we just, we, we aren't gonna, we can't, we can't have like a, a basically a no name programmer do this game, even though like they're so dumb. Cause Joe is ridiculous. He's, he would, he could easily have done this by that's, himself. That's, the, that's no the funniest part. Like they're getting you to bring somebody else on after just trying your game and saying that it plays so smooth and they can't believe that it's this good and this and that. And then they're trying to change Welcome the team to the anyway. Corporate world, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, that that's that kind of stuff is the reason why I, you know, I get there is some uh, anger I still have at, over how that situation went with with Warner Brothers. Um, but nonetheless, I'm I'm connected with. Uh, those people um, that said all that stuff, I'm still connected with them. And, um, you know, they, they said it they, doesn't mean it was their decision, right? You know, they, exactly. They the exactly. I think, I think that, I think that what we have with Warner brothers is that that is a company that is very much built off of finance leads the show. So like when you, when you're at an ad agency, right. The cr creative is king is a very common thing that you say where like if you're a really good creative director and you've won a lot of business, you basically anything you say goes and creative is king. So there's account people that do handle money and all that. But those people you could like nobody cares about those people. What, but in 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 at Warner Brothers, it's the reverse. The finance people are like the smartest people in the room as far as Warner Brothers is concerned and people like Ed. Um, I won't say who said this, but some people have said like, stop talking about Ed. He's like glorified quality assurance for us, which was like literally hurts my soul because it's like, he's the reason you guys have a multi-billion dollar franchise, you idiots. Mm. But like, you know, you want to say those things, but like that, unfortunately that, that's the way they view him. Um, that's and kind of like, really it's not concerning. That's exactly what Phantom and I've been talking about on many of our episodes, how we, yeah. we, like, yes, okay, we have our issues with some of Ed Boon's tweets and stuff, sure. But we, sure. obviously, he's still the co-creator of one of our favorite game series of all time, right? And we, we just feels like he doesn't have the, not power, but the sort of respect that he sort of deserves in this franchise it, within the actual franchise itself. Yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate. They see him as like PR. I mean, I've heard him called a bunch of different things. He's like, he's just PR. He's just this. He's just that. And it's like, um, it, it was, it, it was really disheartening to hear that, um, that that's the way they view it. But so what, what happened at the end of this was it was like two weeks later and all of a sudden I get a phone call from the same uh, lady. Um, and she basically says to me, look, um, I have some bad news. Uh, we're moving ahead with the project, but we're not including your team. So basically we're taking your concept mm. and your idea and all the pitch work that you've done. And we're just going to give it to some other group. And I was like, well, are you going to give it to the company you had me meet with? And she was like, I can't say anything more legally. So this is where our conversation ends. And I was like, okay. She's like, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but that's the way it goes. That's crazy because you guys had already put in so much work into this and, yeah. you know, had a, a playable demo at this point. So the, they're yeah. just rebuilding it from the ground up if they decide to do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and, and so 
what they ended up doing, and it took a little bit while later for me to, to realize it. Um, I think it's pretty, I, I can kind of say this now that it's been out there, but uh, they ended up handing it off to uh, Blind Squirrel. And I have nothing wrong. I have no animosity towards those guys. I have to say that. Um, I've heard that they're not the best in terms of creativity and understanding of like the Mortal Kombat franchise, but they did a really good job on the, um, I think it was the, uh, um, gosh, uh, Bioshock collection. And mm. that, and so Warner Brothers, I guess, knew them from that. And so they were like, oh, they're like the team that can do it end to end. They can do the, gra- they can do all the stuff. And at one point too, I found out that, you know, she and a bunch of people there were friends with the people over, over, uh, uh, over there. So it was kind of like who, you know, and, uh, they were bleeding people. They like had just laid off some people right around that time. And they were basically like, I, from what I understand, word has it, I don't know, this is all rumor that they basically begged for the project. And then it didn't even happen anyway, because what I believe happened, there's a a famous picture out there that you guys may have seen. Um, it's like a mock-up and Scorpion and Sub-Zero are like holding hands. I don't know if you guys have seen that. Maybe. And they pitched that as part of their thing. And now I'm going to be extrapolating from this point on because I don't actually know. But I believe combined with the fact that jo- that uh, Ed was like, we can only trust Joe's team to do it. And I think he was sensing that they were like going over his head. And once they cut us out, I believe that he was just like, no, then we're not doing it at all. Like I think he literally was like, put the kibosh on and he killed it as soon as he knew that I wasn't, I like to think that that's the reason it yeah. may have been another reason. It may have been any reason, but that's the reason I, in my head. Could be. Honestly, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think the, one of the things that he said led me to believe that he's pretty like, he's a man of his word. And if he says that he means it. And if they tried to try to pitch him like, Oh no, we're going to have this other team. Cause they have all this experience. He was just probably just like, yeah, but they've got Scorpion and Sub-Zero holding hands. Like they literally don't know what they're doing. Like, they don't understand that they're mortal enemies, right? You know? Um, so, so um, yeah, I think that that was pretty much all that Ed probably would have need to see. to see. And and if, if creative sign-off is really what he ultimately has to give any of those projects to go through, he, that was probably an easy one for him to be like, nope, we're not doing this. So, um, yeah, that's the full story right there. That's pretty much, that takes you, you know, I, at that point when they came back to us, I basically said to my guys, guys, do you want to continue working together and maybe make our own like fighting game IP and everybody, pretty much everybody except for one person was like, yeah, totally let's do it. And uh, so we did. And, uh, and uh, that was the sort of the birth of, of Ibalistic as a company. And that kind of leads us to like where we are today. Well, okay. Before we get into Ibalistic then I just, I'm, I'm curious because as I mentioned earlier, you do have a few reasons floating around the internet as to why everything ended. And I know you just sort of told us, but like, in okay the 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 reasons that i've i've read for example are that one it might have ruined their their mortal kombat game in 2019 it says uh game sales um right or that they were unconvinced about the sales of the game but then now it's also just that it's uh maybe they wanted a different team so which one would you sort of steer towards is it a combination of the three above yeah so it depends on who you talk to right so i i pitched um, you know, I kind of skip past that stuff because it's boring, but that main pitch that I told you about to Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment was the one of the highlight ones, but I had to pitch the head of sales. I had to pitch the head of marketing. I had to pitch like all these different groups. And it was like saying the same pitch over and over again, but you have to meet mm. a new executive to kind of convince them to move on to the next stage. Um, and I mean, all in, all, when all was said and done, I did several p- pitches um, and each one of them, had a reason for why this is a, this might not work. And, and so that's all I can extrapolate. Like one of the reasons was the sales guys are thinking about, well, is this going to cannibalize sales of Mortal Kombat 11? Like what if it is too successful? Then we, like we all lose our jobs because Mortal Kombat 11 is it. That's what it's supposed to be. And if it's going to, if it steals sales away, from that. So I knew that somebody somewhere had that in their mind that that could potentially be a bad reason. But then you look at the marketing guys and they're like, we don't see a reason to just not make this a free thing that you get when you pre order Mortal Kombat 11. I'm like, yeah, that's what I, I'm totally, let's do that. But they're like, oh, but the, da- the sales guys aren't going to like that because they don't see any uh, operating Money. revenue 
from yeah. that immediately. Um, so, you know, this is the kind of like the, I don't know is really what it comes down to. I really don't know what the real reason is. Um, I think the biggest reason was that we were inexperienced because that's the thing that came across. I mean, it was said a number of times they were like, you guys should be proud that you got this far and nobody gets this far. And especially without having any games under your belt, like you're I, uh, the one guy, Chris, who I had all those arguments with, he's like, Joe, he's like, I'll say this. You're a magician. He's like, I don't, I've never, he's like, I've never met anybody who was able to convince so many people to do something like this um, in my life. Like that, you, he's like, you have a gift. Don't lose that. Whatever it is, don't lose that. And so that really was something that I took to heart. And and I was like, when, when it came time for us to kind of do our own thing, I was like, you know what? I have that ability, I think, that I can actually get people, like I can use that sort of um, natural uh, enthusiasm that I have as a selling point for why my team is so it's a good choice to do this kind of stuff because I don't have the experience to lean on. And I think that that the lack of experience is probably the number one reason why they took it from us. You know, the, I want to say the suits, right. Took it from mm. us. And basically we're like, yeah, we got We have to go by what's going to be the lowest risk, um, risk mitigation. I mean, they have an entire department at Warner brothers just for risk mitigation where they ask you like so many questions, including like what's your willingness to take a drug test. They do an entire background check on you. They want to make sure that you haven't lied on like anything. Um, It's, you know, it makes sense that they would do their due diligence uh, to some degree, but it's not what you'd expect at all. Like, like, yeah, okay, fine. I'll, you know, I'll take a drug test. I'll take whatever you need. Um, They want to make sure that you're clean as a whistle that you have, you're like, if they were going to give you money, that you're not just going to run off with it because it'd be very difficult for them to, uh, well, I'm sure they would just sick a team of lawyers on me, but I, I, you know, I'd have to flee the country. But the other, the other side of it too, is that a lot of people don't realize is that um, the structure of how game development deals work. And this was something I had a really good conversation with uh, Sean about. Um, It it goes to the answer of your question about like, why did they potentially cancel? Sean was like, look, I'm totally into this. And I think that you are going to do what you say you're going to do. He's like, but you have such a small team. What if like your programmer that gets hit by a bus? Um, What if he gets really ill? What if he dies? Like, he's like, these are all morbid things. He's like, um, you know, he's like, I'll tell you a story. There was a company we were working with um, and they uh, were in California and they were by where all the wildfires were, were happening. Um, and their studio like legitimately burned down and he's like, we had already paid them like a million dollars and they were like, we can't finish the game. Like we can't finish it. And they're like, we're going to need more money if you want that to happen. And he's like, it was a complete nightmare. And he's like, and that's something that's completely out of anybody's control. So he's like, that's why we have to go through our due diligence. And that's why everybody's like, well, you have to have five games under your belt. Yeah, this is but all about that. If you've done it before, you can do it again kind of situation. You can only do your due, due diligence so much. I mean, with that with that example you just gave, that's not down to due diligence. That's just force majeure. You can't handle that. That's literally out of your control. So there are always that risk there, that you're going to have. True. Right? So. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I mean, I feel like uh, your voice, what you're saying was probably in the back of my head. And I, I'm sure I, I probably even said that. But a lot of times it's like, well, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. So we've seen a lot of stuff. So kind of get a pat on the head and, and kind mm-hmm. of like, yeah, you don't necessarily know how this really goes kind of situation. So I think that for uh, for us, a lot of the reason why it was canceled was because we just didn't have the um, the experience that they like to see when they're back, trying to back a multi-million dollar project, especially for a billion dollar franchise. So, I mean, somebody somewhere you have to imagine for taking that risk would have to answer to somebody and be like, wait a second, let me get this straight. So you went with a group of fans who've never made a game before and you're going to pay them, you know, close to a million dollars um, to handle a IP that's a billion dollar franchise and you want to keep your job tomorrow. Like I could see that's probably the thing that people were having to deal with in their head. Um, and I, unfortunately, I don't feel like anybody was, uh, has the, um, you know, just the gumption or the, I don't even know what you want to call it, the, the, the guts to, to, to 
to take a chance, right? It's just, why would they? Why would they take a chance on me when they have all these sure options that they could go with? Um, and and the, the value proposition of using my group that we're just like, we're going to work 10 times harder, we're going to do 10 times better because we know the franchise, that is meaningful to Ed because he's the creator, but to WB, who's just the IP owner, they're like, this is, sounds like more risk to me. Like, let's just get somebody who's less risky to do it. But that's the thing. You see the difference between Ed, somebody who's involved in the actual creation of it, and then WB, who are just like the suits. And you'll see that the person with the actual experience is telling you, go with the passion. This yeah. is how it's yeah. going to happen. And then WB is just saying, go with the less risk, go with the less money. Like, and I mean, even that's just listening to what you said about the meetings, like, and even just your first conversation with who was it, Chris, it's like, okay, yes, they're all cutthroat suits, but why? It's so unnecessary when you could actually get so much more done by just genuinely being passionate and nice. There's such an unnecessary negative atmosphere and approach to things from what it sounds like. And not surprising at all, considering the industry, but a shame. Yeah, no, totally. I, I, I mean, I wish that we could change it. I wish that there was a way to, to get, I think that that top down mentality of where the, um, the, finance team kind of rules the roost where they basically are making what I would consider almost like creative decisions too, because um, I, it's, it's like well known that um, the finance team has somebody that is kind of hovering, has, has an office in NetherRealm studio that basically is like the, uh, like a watcher for, for NetherRealm to make sure that um, they're doing what would be most financially beneficial to the company. So it's almost like having a spy uh, in your midst um, to make sure that the decisions you're making are, you know, and I'm sure that person reports back to WB and make sure that their investment right in NetherRealm Studio is, um, is solid and continues to make them as much money as it possibly can. I know I'm, I'm making them sound awful. And I, I do, I do want to point out they're not as bad. They're just people. And at the end of the day, they're doing what most people do. They want to keep their jobs. They want to take the least risk because they don't, they are not incentivized to take a risk. Whereas Ed, maybe um, they're not they're, The incentive is low for them to take risks. So that's why they, they don't. Um, and even from a cultural standpoint, I can, you can feel that it's sort of like, oh, you got to go with the sure thing. Like you can't go with the crazy, like. You know, yeah, that like the tree hugging hippie, you know, whatever guy who loves Mortal Kombat. Yeah, I mean, that's like, sure, but we could find those guys who are a dime a dozen. Like, they don't see their view on Ed, I think, really says it all, right? It's like, if he's glorified QA, if he's, um, you know, um, if he's, if that's all he is to them, that, that kind of gives you the idea of how they are thinking about it to begin with. So it was going to be an uphill battle to, to, yeah. to start. So it's been about three years or so since, you know, the final nail went into the the project. Yeah. But re recently, though, you've relaunched uh, uh, like a petition to get the Kickstarter for the trilogy to to happen again. Yeah. Can you tell us why now and, and what's going on with this project at this point? OK, so um, a little bit of embarrassment. I uh, didn't come up with the idea to do the petition. So that there's a guy on Twitter, his name is Minzy. Um, and he basically was like, dude, I want this to happen. Uh, what, what can I do to support you? I'm thinking of starting a petition. And I figured I was like, Oh, that's fine. Like, I don't think I ever said no, but I was like, you know, those things, I don't know how well that kind of a thing would do. Um, and then he basically was like, the next day he was like, all right, so what do you want me to put in this petition? I was like, oh, I'm curious. Like he wants to do this. Um, and I, meanwhile, just because, um, so I run a game development studio. And so we're in contract right now for an unnamed game that I can't talk about yet, but, um, and we're, um, it's a fighting game. I can say that much. Um, and we're working on the PlayStation five and the Xbox series consoles. And we're doing stuff for PC. And eventually we're going to have a, a switch release for this game. And, um, so I've been very heavily involved with our current engine, which we use, um, which is Unity. And unfortunately, when we came to doing some of the, I got to be very careful because I don't want to have Unity's lawyers coming after me, but um, they, we did not have the best experience when it came to um, taking our PC code and converting it to the Xbox and the PlayStation consoles. There's the, the support was very limited and, 
there's just a lot that needed um, that we didn't get. And so it got us looking to other game development platforms. And so the other big one is Unreal Engine and Unreal Engine 5 had just come out and it's, it's amazing. It can do graphics like we, you know, you dream of um, stuff that almost is so real looking that you can't tell the difference um, between reality and, and, and games. Like and, how Mortal Kombat um, 1 was, right? Yeah, except to me. That's what, to, to, I, and in fact, that's that's the thing I always bring up. I think I even said it to Ed. I was like, I imagine a world where you like use photogrammetry, which is like a way to a technique to take pictures and and then create three D objects out of them that look just like the photo, but they're actually three D. Um, and uh, I was like, I imagine a world where like the entire game is like redone in three D, but with um, all photogrammetry objects and stuff. So it's like, re- you know, it's like real stuff, just like the original game was. And Ed was awesome. like, wow, that would be wild. Like that would be like, we all kind of paused for a second, like back in 2016, I think that was the first conversation. It was like, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Um, and then, and so, uh, but yeah, in, in terms of, of, you know, what led this to this petition, it was just me testing Mortal Kombat, my, what I love, right? Um, just like, hey, it'd be cool to go back and start doing some of these stages that I was doing heavily when it was just like a fan project back in 2011 and uh, and just kind of see what I can do. And then I was like, whoa, the capabilities of this are like, like blew my mind. I was like, and it's so easy to do. And of course, my art skills have improved a whole bunch um, since then. So now I can do stuff that I couldn't do before. Like in the past, I, there's a program called ZBrush where you actually sculpt with clay, but I'm a, I'm a real sculptor. I can sculpt things in real life, but using digitally sculpting is different. And I never could really, I was, I started it back in 2011 and just years and years and years of practicing with it. Now I can pretty much make anything that I can see, like if I have enough references for it. So one of the thing reasons why maybe I stopped for a little while is that I didn't feel like I was good enough to be able to like, you know, the pit three is a great example. That was the first, I think that was the first stage or no, I, I started with um, uh, the combat tomb, I think was the very first stage I started in, in Unreal Engine, but I went and I did the, the pit three eventually. And I, I was always scared off from that one because it requires me to like legitimately do sculpt a statue. Oh no, that's what it was. Deadpool, the Deadpool, there's that statue of the lady or whatever with the thing over her shoulder, like pouring water. That was, I had to hand sculpt that. And cause I couldn't find the statue. I couldn't like buy it and then use photogrammetry techniques like I've done in the past, like to, to try and and get that to be right. So this was going to be a test. I was going to have to put all my efforts together to try and make this statue. And, uh, and I was surprised that I was able to pull it off. And then now with Substance Painter, being able to like paint all the details and like make it so that some parts of it have moss and like you can just do so much more now. And and so I was, and then and then see all that in the game, like at 4K resolution, it's just like pops. I was like, this is awesome. And so I was just doing it for myself. Um, I have a tendency to be a night owl. I'm up until like two, three a.m. every night, and uh, for whatever reason, that's just like where I'm most creative. I have two kids, so you might have heard my my daughter run in before, but um, you know, like uh, it makes it tough to find time to sort of like get into that creative space. And just doing that, like just creating these things for me, it's sort of like a way to unwind and just sort of like really get into that. I don't know if you we call it like flow, like that flow state where like everything time just melts away and you're just like creating. And it's like the coolest, it's an art thing for sure, but like, or a musician thing, like if you're just playing, you know, like, like that kind of thing, like you just get into it and you're just, you're just there. It's like time just stop, stand still. And you're just like at Zen with the computer at that point, just making all this stuff happen. And so I was doing it purely for my own, like, I guess, well-being. Like I was like, I just need to do something that, because while making games during the day is fun, I'm doing it under contract. Um, and I'm certainly passionate about it, but it's a job at the end of the day. And there's, you know, there's pressures and all sorts of things that you have to deal with that come along with that. And so this was just a way to like, kind of like learn about the capabilities of Unreal Engine 5, which we might be using and aren't, we're definitely going to be using in our next project. And, and, uh, and it, like sort of make something that I care about. And so that's how it all came together. The, the, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, the current uh, petition. 
And I was surprised, you know, it was like in seven days or so, or whatever it is, it's been now we've had, I think it's like up to 700 people had signed on. Um, and we ended up posting, uh, you know, pictures on the Facebook groups and stuff like that to really get the word out there. I still feel like we've, I've, um, between Minzy and I, we've probably reached probably a 10th of a 10th of the percentage of the people who need to see it and need to know about it, um, for it to, to go anywhere. Um, but it's, it's like a slow burn, right? Like people, more and more people are kind of sharing it and, um, and yeah, I'm hoping to, to get more people to know about it because truly the reason, one of the other reasons that I never got to before about why it was canceled was because they felt like it would be too expensive and not enough people would buy it. And I think, I think that's complete garbage. I totally, I, I mean, I think I told Chris that at the time I told, I told Sean that I was like, John, this is bullshit. No, there's no way. Like I could, like, I don't know who you guys are hiring for your marketing analytics, but like I have, you know, all these years of experience in marketing, I can tell you unequivocally you're wrong, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, listen, Joe, he's like, it's an entire department. Like you gotta, we have to listen to them. Um, but to some degree, uh, I think just have showing that that support exists and that people would be willing to support it. That's like, it's, that's pretty much half the battle. It's at, it's at least half the battle. If we can show that like, you know, several thousand people, I, I mean, I, I set a goal of like a hundred thousand would be amazing. Right. But if we could show a, that, you know, several thousand people are interested in this, believe me, that would change the, the suits minds. Cause they see money. They just see dollars. They see passion behind it with the community. They see it being the right time then to do it. And um, especially with Mortal Kombat's 30th anniversary coming up, it sort of could be the perfect storm for it. But, you know, that's that's going to be up to the community, I think, to support it. So is the, the plan basically to do a repitch to Warner Brothers at, uh, once you get yeah. enough voters yeah. on this? Yeah, yeah. So and, we want to we, we wanna get up. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> Oh, and, and then uh, I was also going to say, you, you had sent us previously uh, a few images to see what the game looks like. Yeah. Um, are, is that okay to share with our audience so that they can oh, see these absolutely. two? Yeah, yeah, um, please do. Yeah. So everything in these images, you basically, or your team has been building from the ground up. Like it's yeah. not uh, old images or anything like that, that you've upscaled, but you, you've actually done a complete remake of, of the yeah. game. Yes, yeah. That's, that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, so every every element there, most of the stuff you see is is uh, stuff that I did. Um, Gabe did all of the character. Any anytime you see characters, um, and then of course uh, um, uh, M- MK Column. I, I'm going to say his, his uh, Twitter oh, name yeah. wrong. Uh, he did the subway, which was awesome. Him and I kind of collaborated on that. We talked about some improvements that could be made. And he, he, to his credit, he was like, oh man, you're totally right. Let's do it. And he, that's the picture I've looked at the most because it's got rain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> rain's awesome. Rain's awesome. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a group effort to try and kind of rekindle the interest. The thing that I, can, I guess I'm struggling with now is that I've sort of like emptied the bank of stuff that I had been working on for months. And so now it's going to be like a month or so before you see like more images because I'm literally creating them every night. So, I mean, I, well, it's inspiring to see all these people that are like, Oh my God, this is so cool. Like do this next, do that next. I'm like, Oh uh, yeah, this takes time guys. Like that's <laughs> like, you know, a uh, hundred hours worth of work to get the, each one of these done, you know? Um, and I'm doing a little bit each night before, before going to bed. So, um, or passing out at my desk or whatever. So yeah, totally. Um, yeah, that, it, that's, I, 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 while I know that the inspiration of this maybe won't last, um, we're going to have to try and find other ways to kind of keep this going, keep people interested. Um, and so I might do, um, like one offs. I, I think there's one there that I shared where, um, sub zero is like, you know, his arms in the air and a victory pose. Um, and, and so, I can show the difference between some of the characters that we have, like HD version version versus um, l- low def version. And I'll probably do some of that just to kind of fill in the gaps between not having new things to show. Um, and certainly, obviously, if we get to the point where just a massive amount of people start coming in and like we reach a point where I feel like I can confidently um, reach out to Warner Brothers about this, I will certainly do that. And I'll share all these images and I'll share all this, this petition. And the petition is really going to be a pivotal element to that pitch. 
because that's going to be the thing they look at and they're going to be like, okay, we're going to count those people as um, ambassadors. You know, it, when it comes to marketing, you have sort of influencers. There's like, there's this thought that every, for every influencer, there's 10 people that they influence. And then out of that network, there's a lesser influencer of those 10 people who influences their network of 10 people. And so um, that's how, like, that's how we operate in, in marketing when we're thinking about like promoting a new product, whether it's like some new brand of cookies or uh, a new car, um, you want to get the word of mouth out there and you want to really show, um, you know, um, that there's people that are interested in it. And there's that, that thinking that, yeah, if you get, you know, the right people who are, uh, ambassadors to the brand, like brand ambassadors to really talk about it, share it and like it and get their friends into it, that the number you come up with initially, like if it's 10,000 people that could, you, you could easily take that number and at least uh, multiply it by five and you get a good representation of like what you might sell the game for. So yeah, these are all like the things that I'm thinking about. And this is why that, that, um, that petition is just so important. Well, we'll definitely be sharing that petition then, and we'll be putting it in the description of this video too. But one thing that has stuck with me that you've said is that obviously you signed an agreement with WB saying that if they chose to go with somebody else, then you know, you, you've given up legal rights to all your work on the project and such. Firstly, I do find that interesting in the sense that they're sort of admitting to the fact that it's your IP in that sense. Not Mortal Kombat is your IP, but the work that you've done is your IP. I like that sort of, sort of weird little indirect admission. But the other thing is, yeah. more, or more so my question rather, is if you were back in contact with WB again and you were in that exact same situation, but for the second time, would you sign that agreement once again, knowing what they did to you in the past? I think that you don't get a seat at the table to even have any discussion unless you sign that agreement. So I'd have to say yes, <clears throat> unfortunately. Okay. Um, I think it's, it, it, it's just uh, kind of a shitty thing that these companies that are really big, that have a lot of money, can do to protect themselves legally so that you, know, you kind of know what you're getting into before you get started and they can easily just ditch you at any moment and that's just the way it goes. Um, I think that you need to have some level of resilience um, and understand that it's just business. Um, and I can tell you that um, having met with these guys, even at the executive level at Warner Brothers, um, that they respect the fact that I haven't given up and all through all this time. Um, and I know that, they, I mean, these guys have reached out to me on LinkedIn to kind of be a connection and sort of, it's sort of like no hard feelings, you know, keep the door open for there to be other discussions in the future. So that's, um, that's why uh, you never know. You just never know what, where it can go. Um, but yeah, I certainly think that the petition and them, you know, seeing that it could have value and that it would be so good would be, would really move the needle. Um, and, and there's definitely that understanding that we did you wrong uh, last time or that it didn't work out. You know, they have memory of that whole situation um, and that really it had nothing to do with me. It was more around the situations that were kind of out of, out of my control. Like I can't control how much uh, experience my team had at that point. Well, of course. But so. today yeah. I could show them like we have net frame rollback and all this crazy online tech that's like proprietary that we built over the last few years um, where I can play against somebody on the other coast and it's like there's zero uh, latency or, or um, you know, lag. Yes, you, you and, shared a video of that. I think it was somebody in one state versus somebody in another state. And absolutely, or at least to the, to the eye, there was no latency at all. And that's yeah. an amazing. And that's something that NetherRealm could really benefit from. I can tell you that from experience. <laughs> yeah, I, I, know from, I know from experience that with Mortal Kombat 10, they were not using uh, net frame rollback at all. What we, we colloquially know as GGP, uh, was it, was it, um, GGPO, good game, peace out. Um, that was okay. invented by Tony Cannon. He's a brilliant, I'm connected with him on LinkedIn too. He's a great guy. Um, but he, he, they ended up, uh, Riot Games, I think, snatched him up. They're working on a fighting game. And I would expect that to have some of the best rollback tech ever because he's literally the inventor of it. Um, mm. and, uh, we took, he, he made his code open source for a very short period of time. 
we grabbed it, you know, so I got to give him credit for that. Um, and then we took it and we just built upon it, um, adding uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning to try and guess what, what moves you've made so that we are like super accurate about what the reality of the situation is when you're playing online from such a long distance. Um, and so, yeah, I, our tech is really special. Um, what's really exciting for me is like now that we're doing this new game uh, that I'm working on, there's uh, getting to get that to run on the PlayStation and the Xbox was a pretty exhilarating experience because, you know, we've got it running on Epic Online Services, which is like the backbone of Fortnite. So it's, it's very robust. And um, we've and got our tech. with millions of players works. too. Yeah, exactly. It's te- it's 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 really it's been battle tested, right? You could say. And so I, I feel uh, really confident that if they were like, "Hey, so how do why should we trust that you're going to get online play?" Right? I mean, actually, Chris at one point said that he was like, "Why should I trust that you're going to be able to do online play when that cost us at the time it was like five north of five million or something to like <laughs> have an expert come in and like." help them rip out their net code for MKX and turn it into uh, rollback code. Well, that's the most ironic part, they it. that they gave you trouble for that, when in reality, their, their last two games have now had extremely bad net code to the point where it's known in the fighting game community to have one of the worst sort of net codes in the game, in all of the fighting games. And yet yeah, they gave yeah. you crap for that. It's like, come on, guys, you know? Well, I think, but, I think yeah. what it was is it's a pain point for them and they were like, if you, if we're a billion dollar company and we couldn't solve it, like, there's just no way you're going to solve it. It's that sense of arrogance, though. That's the thing that's oh, really oh, yeah. to it, me. You it's know? there. And it's there. Yep. You're, you're, you're like, you're, your team is now, uh, idealistic, has now sort of, yeah. as you mentioned, you've, you're basically the entire same team as it was for the Mortal Kombat project, bar one yeah. person. And yeah. on yeah, top absolutely. of that, you're looking for, I think at the time of this recording, you're looking for a senior producer, online network engineer, and character yep. artist, right? So yep. it's good to see yep. that firstly, the group is at, or to the core as much as it can be is the same as before, and you're still looking okay. to sort of expand. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. I, th- I think that part of that, the reason my guys have all stayed loyal and wanted to be a part of this is um, it, we've been through the trench, the trenches together, and that sort of builds a bond. Um, at this point, and I've, I've been able to get legitimate game projects. So like, well, it was a huge failure, right? At the end of the day, all that work and effort for the Warner Brothers pitch, um, th- that they saw how close we got my team and they, they stick with this group because there's this feeling like we're special. We're going to get something done if we can just keep sticking it out. And since we've, we've had two game projects since then, uh, the one that we're in currently and the, the, um, another one, which was canceled, uh, midway through. Um, but you know, not to our own fault. It was like, we were doing our part. Um, so we, we still haven't released the game yet. I mean, we have our VR game, Beatron 2000, which is great, but you know that we haven't released like a console game. So that soon, hopefully very soon, we're going to have, we'll be able to tick that box and that game will have the online play elements to it, proving once and for all that A, we can do consoles, which is super important to publishers. And B, we can do consoles with online play, which is like everything. So um, I think that when the world sees that, our phone's not going to stop ringing off the hook in terms of like new game projects. I already have like right now cooking up um, some really exciting things that, you know, I'm not going to talk about yet because it's not mm-hmm. yet in a state where I can, but certainly like very exciting stuff where investors have seen our tech and have kind of seen this and that they're like, whoa, this is like, we want to back you. Um, you know, we'll see how things go at the end of the month when we have our next meeting, but certainly um, th- this, this uh, capability of being able to do the, the online play and doing the, the consoles is going to be a big one for us. And I think that's going to help drive the company uh, success forward. And I think that's part of the reason why people are sticking around because they want to kind of see where it goes. Well, I mean, even just based on my experience looking through your website, firstly, I must say, I love the website. I really do. It's pretty cool. (laughs) Although I will say as well, I would love some dark mode compatibility, but (laughs) keep that, keep that in the suggestion box. (laughs) But um, like looking through, uh, you seem to have a, 
a really good team put together and everything. I'm looking at it on the other screen right now. And sure. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in the fact, like you've mentioned that you're working on a game, which I'm assuming is not one of the games on the list here. You do yeah, have I can't, three I games out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Beatron 2000, uh, VR music rhythm game, which honestly looked yeah. pretty cool. I checked it out uh, for its time, oh, right? Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. And then you've got Lawless, which looks very interesting to me, I must say. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I can give you the quick backstory on that. That was, I after Mortal Kombat, that was basically our own IP. It's sort of the one that got away. I want to make Lawless one day. Um, but basically, we got into uh, a really... Um, uh, Matt Karsh over at Saber Interactive uh, was the one who finally said yes to this crazy group of Mortal Kombat fans that have no actual games. I did like 10 pitches and he was the 10th one. Um, everybody either laughed me out of the room or just said, no, we're not interested because you guys have no experience. But uh, Matt, to his credit, um, was like, I don't even know why I'm saying yes because this is such a big investment of money and you guys could just totally screw us. He's like, but I, your passion, like, I just want to say yes to you, Joe. He's like, I just want to say yes. So he's like, we're going to do this. And so we did, and we were on that project for about eight months. So we actually have a playable of it. And, um, that was when we started building our net frame rollback tech and all that stuff. That was really early days. Um, and, uh, it was a paid project. We were getting paid. It was great. And you know, that, that brought the team together. Everybody was like, yeah, finally we're getting paid like actual money as game developers. You know, it's like everything prior to that was sort of like, we were just creating stuff out of thin air and then hoping it would sell. Um, You know, Beatron is an example of that. Like you create that game in your spare time and then you hope it sells. Um, And, and, and so that game, unfortunately, uh, Sabre was going through a big transition. They ended up getting bought by a huge company called Embracer for, you know, I mean, it's public, so I think I can say it's like over a half a billion dollars. And so Embracer basically said, look, here's the games you can and can't work on. Um, and our game got cut from that list. Um, and we were oh, in conversations no. We were in conversations with, um, at the time, we were talking to like Dark Horse Comics to do like a really cool crossover game with Dark Horse. And those guys loved what we were doing. Um, and yeah, it all kind of came to a halt. And I have all their contacts and... So in the future, uh, Dark Horses, I mean, um, if we ever wanted to do that kind of thing, uh, we, would, we would probably reach out to them and see what, how they could do on sort of licensing some of their better known characters like The Mask and Hellboy and Barbwire and Ghost. And I don't know if you guys are comic book fans, but um, Ghost is a really big deal in comics. Um, and uh, um, Grendel and X, um, there's, there's just a lot of, Dark Horse and Dark Horse has sort of been looking at what was happened, what happened with Injustice, with sort of a um, probably, I guess you'd say like a little bit of a, a jealous eye. Like, look at how well that game did uh, if you have the right person like leading it. And so I sold them. I was like, this is going to be great. And Saber was backing us. We thought this was going to all come to fruition, and then it um, it got canceled. It's got a great story behind it, and it's like it's definitely going to be. That's like my um, game that. I'm just going to keep repitching until somebody says yes. You know, like eventually we're going to get to do it. And if we did it today, we would do like, you always think about improvements because the combat system in that game is so awesome. Like it's, uh, it takes a little bit of killer instinct and a little bit of mortal combat. I was going to say, it looks like the perfect blend of those games. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. Cause you can, cause you know how in mortal combat you have like the juggles and, and you have dial combos and in in um, in uh, Street Fighter, you have uh, it's less dial combos and more like twitch combos, where it's like you know punch punch punch, and then like drop down to your to your to the ground and do a few kicks, and you can make combos that way. Um, and so a little bit Marvel versus Capcom, if you're familiar with that. Um, and and so so this game had this really cool thing where any any uh, starter linker or finisher could be you could you could use like your finisher as a linker you could use your linker as a finisher um really oh, cool so it, wow. it like, could kind of mix and match your combo styles and this is from years of talking to uh like competitive fighting game players um we know a few that we talk to um and also we have a few guys on our team that i wouldn't say they're 
necessarily maybe like tournament level. Well, they are tournament level players. They played in tournaments, but not like they've not won. It's not like uh, Sonic Fox or anybody like that, like well known. But in terms of like, they kind of know like from a competitive standpoint, what do you want to see in a fighting game? And what would be appealing to like Mortal Kombat, Killer Instinct, and like Street Fighter fans all at once, bring us all under one family, like where we could all agree that like this is right, like, fight, or, well we want to fight but we don't want to hate <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah so that anyway that's that's the story behind that game and i i would love to see it happen um and there's a my avatar character that i go by Calactite is actually in that game so it has even more meaning to me um because oh. i was drawing that character since i was like seven years old i'm seven, seven years yeah since i was seven years old yeah wow no, maybe no yeah i was no i was probably a little I think I invented his name when I was seven and didn't really start drawing him or come up with this concept until I was more like 10. But yeah, the point is it was definitely, um, it's, it's like a part of my DNA. So to yeah. have him represented in the game, it's just so cool to play him. Like the combos you can do with him and his special moveset. Like I'm super, like I'm fanboying out about my own game, which is like, so you're not supposed to do that, but that, like, no, I totally, that's great. That's the real I passion. want this game to happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, no, I it, it's, to say Based on what I've seen of your game, of, of that game, like obviously there's not too much to have a look at, but based on what yeah. I read about it with the whole storyline, the customization elements, the, the fact that you are focusing also on the competitive side too, which I'm not a big competitive player, but I do enjoy the competitive scene, right? And so it's nice to see all of that come together, especially with that sort of blended fighting style. So I will personally be I'm keeping my fingers crossed for this game to come out at some point, oh, honestly. Thank you so much. I, I, I really appreciate it. I, I think it's going to be one of those things that once I ballistic finally like hits it big, uh, which I, I think is going to happen at one point or another, I believe that's going to happen. Um, we'll either finance it ourselves or we'll be, we'll be at a point where the question of if you guys can make a game is no longer on the back of anybody, any investor's mind. It's sort of like, what, how soon can you get it done? And like, is there still a market for it kind of situation? So um, I, I fully believe that it will come to light, um, but it may not be for a few years until we um, have the time and we have the investor support for it. Well, you do have another game in development, which also is quite, well, very interesting to me. But so Mortal Kombat is my favorite game series of all time. My favorite game of all time is Bloodborne. And you have a oh, game yeah. here <laughs> called Cold Blood in development, which is Dark Souls meets Metroidvania. And I mean, even just based on the name, Cold Blood, I'm assuming there is some Bloodborne in, uh, inspiration. Oh, yeah, yeah, there yeah. Well. yeah so. We're huge Bloodborne fans over here, huge Bloodborne fans. And um, this one, I have to give uh, credit to Justin Slaughter, who's, who's our, he's sort of like brilliant. He's not just a great musician, um, but he also does like programming. He did one of the, one of the versions of Mortal Kombat um, that have been floating around on the internet in HD in Game Maker. Um, and he, uh, has been teaching himself unity and, um, he was like, man, we, we, we really need to focus on this, like Metroidvania meets, meets like, uh, meets Bloodborne kind of area because there's really nobody's doing this. Like, and he had this, uh, this concept where like you, you could go up and that's like one direction you can go or one path you can go down and that's another path, path, uh, path. You can go left or you can go right, and that's another path. And so, like, for non-linear exploration, basically, yeah. But for a Metroidvania game, like that's yeah. like nobody's really doing that. And so, um, we uh, we came up with a combat system. We've got all this stuff ready to go. And I was, and I recently had an investor tell me they were interested because these kinds of games just they don't cost a lot to make, not nearly as much as like you know a Lawless would cost. Um, and they'll never go out of style either. They don't go out of style, right? Because there's this, there's a certain nostalgia that I feel like people connect with and want. Um, and, and so uh, you can release them on multiple platforms now that we have like this console export capability. And so I think, yeah, the game would probably sell better than like from a sales perspective. It's probably the, the thing that would do hand, like easily would do the best out of every game that we've done, even though it would be the, the cheapest. Unfortunately, when I try to explain that to, um, to investors, they're just not buying it yet. 
Um, mm. And, you know, I have to show them sort of other similar games. And there's a lot out there. There's a lot of game. And Dead Cells sold like 4 yeah. million um, copies. And you could, you could go on and on. It's like um, uh, Shovel Knight. Um, uh, what's another one? Hollow Knight. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of games out there. Ori and the and and Ori and the Blind Forest. Yeah, yeah great Blind Forest. Yeah, and, and and these games aren't that expensive to produce, but they get a massive return uh, for you know the amount of investment that's in them because people want to buy those like twenty four ninety nine dollar games, nineteen ninety nine dollar games, and just get, just dive into them and and those games they prefer rather than like the giant triple A titles, sometimes the cyberpunks of the world or whatever. Um, so the, uh, yeah. So certainly that's a game that we have. I always bring it up in every pitch meeting as sort of like a, um, a, uh, a, a game in our stable of things that we want to do. Um, we're also getting into, um, we've seen the success of Streets of Rage 4. Um, and, you know, we love those games, those side scrolling brawlers, those games that we used to play in the arcade with like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and uh, yeah. Simpsons Arcade, all those. And um, that's a thing that we're looking at potentially bringing back, but we want to put a spin on it um, in terms of this is a different, different concept that we've been floating around, though where um, it's a little bit more like an RPG. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so like, beat em up RPG mixture, which was, I, I think would do really well because it's, it's just unique enough. There is one game, um, something Witch, Witcher, I'm, I'm going to get the name wrong. It's not The Witcher, but it's uh, something about, uh, something, oh, Dragon's Crown. It had nothing to do with Witches. Dragon's Crown, which is okay. very, uh, it sold really, really well. Um, and it hasn't, they haven't released, they re-released it in HD recently, but it was like a PlayStation three era game. And, uh, oh, you know, yes, yes. I and, yeah. Is. And it was beautiful art. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, that game, uh, we, I was looking at that recently. I was like that we need more of those types of games. Like that's a really cool concept. And of course there's, um, the fan favorite, um, uh, castle crashers, which, uh, sold like some ridiculous amounts, like 20 million. I love castle sold. crashers. Yeah, and so we want to, that's the kind of thing we want to do. Like four people brought together in a party, just like kicking ass against like computer opponents as the level of difficulty goes up, but mix in RPG elements where like, it's like, I need a heal. You know, like I don't know if you guys ever played, um, uh, you know, World of Warcraft or, uh, you know, EverQuest or any of those kinds of uh, MMORPGs, but that mm -hmm. kind of bring that kind of camaraderie into that genre would be really, really cool. But um, it's just stuff right now. It's just all in my head, things that I'd love to love to do. Um, and Cold Blood, though, is totally not my not my thing. That is 100% uh, Justin Slaughter. He's like the creator of it. Um, and he, uh, you know, we would make it under the Ibalistic label. Um, and, and certainly we'd use our programming team and our art team to, to do it. Um, but he's, you know, it would be a... Uh, a by Justin Slaughter kind of thing. Like it would be, he, cool. he'd be the, the owner of the game because it's his, it's his concept. Right. Well, I mean, it's been really cool talking, not just about Mortal Kombat HD, but also I, I believe like it's, it's really nice to see that sort of transition from that. Well, the entire process really going from just being on a forum, creating Mortal Kombat HD with the random people coming together as a team, going through this entire arduous process really of getting this game out which still isn't out but fingers crossed and then coming now into your own as a studio i ballistic and seeing all these projects so really thank you for telling us all about this and i'm really really excited to see where this goes uh but thank i think you for having Bantin, me well Bantin, i think has a question for you yeah i do so before we sure. completely let you go um you know we like to ask all of our our visitors onto the show what is your favorite finishing move? Whether it's a fatality, brutality, animality, what, what is your all time favorite? Yeah. So I would have to say, um, Hey, despite the fact that I play Scorpion, like most of the time, I would say it's Baraka MK two, where he takes his two, you know, uh, swords that come out of his arms and kind of impales you up into the, into the air yeah. and then kind of you slide down. Uh, I remember seeing that and just being like, oh, that's so cool. Like, I need to figure out how to do that. I felt like the other one that he had where he could, like, chop your head off was sort of like, okay, well, I saw that one coming from a mile away. 
Um, but the the, <laughs> the one where he kind of steps into yeah he did too. <laughs> 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 uh, but it, it able to do that to do that uh, to do that move was really cool. I remember the first time I was able to pull it off. Um, it was super exciting, and I, I worked at an arcade for a little while too. Uh, later on, and it was well after the popularity of Mortal Kombat Two was in its peak. It was more like Mortal Kombat Four was like really what was the thing at that point. Um, but I would still just like give myself tons of credits, you know, right? Because I worked there and I could just play the game on my break. I'd be playing for like an hour, um, and and I would just I remember. Like later on, like I would just always pick Baraka and I would just, anybody that I played against, that was the fatality that I would always, I would always come back to. So. And then where exactly can our listeners find you? Um, is eyeballistic the best way to be tracking your progress as you're continuing to all these different projects or uh, would you like to plug your own Twitter or Instagram and things like that? Yeah, I think just the Twitter. Twitter is probably the best place to find me. Um, I'm I'm such a Twitter noob. Like I basically just discovered Twitter this year. For my, <laughs> it's so bad. Um, so like I have like no followers or anything. So it'd be cool to have somebody like care about what's going on. Um, <laughs> uh, my my uh, my Twitter handle is at Calactite, and that's C A L A C T Y T E. Um, and that's that's my character that I like. I've been drawing since I was seven years old. So uh, that's where that name comes from. And uh, yeah, so you can find me on there. And I think that's probably the place where I do most of, uh, you know, new stuff is going to show up there about the MKT, um, you know, petition. And that's where I just put everything uh, first and foremost. I guess I'm like addicted to like the the uh, the feedback when people are like, oh, that's so awesome. I'm like, yes, <laughs> like I need this. This is this makes me feel good. Like, I'm, you know, it's, it's a drug, right? Um, so uh, totally, like I admit to to that, to I love that. Um, that's really cool. And it's just cool, like meeting with other people. Like I, the other day I was just talking to, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the guy who is redoing Mortal Kombat on the Sega Genesis, but making it more like the arcade version. Do you, do you guys know that guy? He's from Brazil, I think. Oh, is you mean the Mugen project, the huge one? I, I don't. Or... It's not a Mugen project. No, it's it's um. He's literally now. So I wish I knew his name. I just started following him yesterday, but I've been following him on YouTube like a bunch because I was like blown away. I could, you could see he sends his his YouTube videos, and basically what he did is he took the Genesis version of Mortal Kombat. And he like, he's a programmer. So he like hacked it and he made it the way I think we all wanted Mortal Kombat on Genesis to be like, or maybe the way like my, you know, 14 year old brain saw Mortal Kombat back then or 15 year old brain. Like it was, it was, it was every sound effect that the game didn't have. Cause it used to be like, you know, it, when it said Scorpion wins or whatever, it wouldn't, there was no announcer's voice on the place to, on the, yeah. uh, Sega Genesis, but the uh, Super NES version had like a ton of sounds and more colors. And although it didn't have blood, it had sweat and didn't have any fatalities. So the Genesis version always won. So what he's done is he's gone back and little by little, I don't know how long he's been doing it for, um, but he's been like uh, basically changing the ROM to make it have all of the sound effects that it was missing. And it proves that like they could have done it back then, but they just didn't. Um, and so he's made the graphics look better. I mean, he's really, really interesting. Uh, anyway, I'm kind of like fanboying about out about this well, guy. I just give us his link, and we'll put it in the description. Yeah, I got, I'm gonna have to send it to you after the fact. But yeah, like I want to plug him because um, the other day, like anyway, what I was trying to get at was I happened to be talking about the Mortal Kombat stuff, and somebody had asked a question like. Oh, what was like your favorite version of Mortal Kombat? And I said, Oh, I liked it on 32X because it was like Mortal Kombat 2 was really great on there. It didn't disappoint. And he chimed in and was like, That's the best version of it. Like, I like it too. Anyway, the point being that like I'm getting a chance to meet people that are passionate about Mortal Kombat, that are really, really skilled, that I would be like, Oh, dude, I would legitimately hire him <laughs> if he was into it, <laughs> um, you know, to, to like w work with us together on any project in the future. Because that's the kind of person that you want. You want somebody who's like a, a diehard fan. Um, that's just where the best work's going to come from. So yeah, Twitter, long story short, I discovered social media like I was born yesterday. And I <laughs> so, that's, yeah. you know, I, I think that's kind of amazing throughout this whole interview is how eyeballistic is kind of the accumulation of what the fan community can become over time. 
and, and sure. you know, just kind of showing how if we all kind of come together, what we can make out of, you know, our passion in, in for everybody, it seems to be the passion is mortal combat or fighting games and that sort of thing. So it, it's cool to see. So, uh, Joe, we really appreciate you coming on the show today and just talking about not only, you know, your work with mortal combat HD, but everything you've done, uh, since, you know, you first started this project. So it's, it's been great having you on the show. Yeah. Thank, thank you, for you guys really. so much for having me. Yeah, this has been, this is awesome. I can tell you guys are really passionate about what you do. And like I said, I'm legitimately a fan. So I'll be, I'll be, you know, listening to all the, the interviews and things that you do in the future. But, um, yeah, it's really cool that you guys gave me sort of a forum to talk your ear off for two <laughs> hours. Um, so I, th- I thank you for that. Yeah. Well, we thank you having you well. on. <laughs> and Thanks a we lot. Like a- We'd also like to thank all of our listeners for stopping by the Realmcast today. You can find Yanni and myself, Phantom, on the Mortal Kombat group on Facebook, as well as Yanni on the Mortal Kombat meme realm. Special thanks to Uppercut Editions, who are creating the Mortal Kombat compendium for the continued support. You can follow them at EncyclopediaMK on Twitter and the Mortal Kombat Encyclopedia Project on Facebook. You can catch up on all episodes of the Realmcast on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, and Spotify. Experimenting with something new for some time, and the results have been more than we could have hoped for. 